Okay, welcome to the Semantic Enabled Biomedical Literature Analytics Workshop here at the ACM Web Conference. We have three sessions. Um, first is our keynote with Dr. Karen Vespor, who's Executive Dean of the School of Computing Technologies at RMIT University of Melbourne, followed by paper presentations. Uh, second, we have our um, second session, which starts at 3.20 p.m. France time, um, 9.20 Eastern, 8.20 Central, 7.20 Mountain, 6.20 Pacific, and 11.20 in Melbourne, which starts with paper presentations followed by a keynote by Dr. Olivier Bodenreiter from the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. And finally, our third session starts at 6.15 France time, um, 12.15 Eastern, 11.15 Central, 12 Mountain, 11.15 Pacific, and 2 a.m. in Melbourne, um, which consists of a panel discussion with um, Melissa Handel, who is Professor in Chief Research Informatics Officer at Morisco Chair in Data Science School of Medicine at the University of Colorado, Anschutz, Trevor Cohen, Professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education at the University of Washington, and Chunhua Wang, Professor in Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. So I um, would like to um, um, very excited for our first keynote speaker, Dr. Karen Verspoor. Uh, she is professor, or she is currently executive dean of the School of Computing Technologies at our RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. She previously was a professor in the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne, as well as deputy director of the university's Health and Biomedical Informatics Center. And before, she was principal of research at NICTA, Victoria Research Lab, serving as the scientific director for health and life sciences and lead of the biomedical informatics team. She moved to um, Melbourne in December of 2011 from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, where she was research assistant professor in the Center of Computing, Pharmacology, and faculty of the Computational Bioscience Program. She also spent five years at Los Alamos National Laboratory and nearly five years in startups during the US tech bubble and a year as a research fellow at Macquarie University in Sydney. Um, she's received her undergraduate degree in computer science and cognitive science from Rice University in Houston and her master's and PhD in cognitive science and natural language from the University of Edinburgh in the uh, UK. So I'm pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Karen Vespoor. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, yeah, that was a mouthful. I'm sorry, my career has, I've moved many times, as you can tell, <laughs> and uh, it's been keeping me busy and challenging. Uh, um, Karen, but, before we start, uh, yeah. can I ask you whether we can, oh, we're recording already. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that you're okay with recording. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. That's, that's completely okay. fine. Um, what I will do, though, is close this little screen over here. All right, so I can see my own screen better. Good. Um, so um, given that the name of the workshop is um, a semantically enabled biomedical language analysis, I thought that or literature analysis, I thought that um, we should ask the question of why bother um, enabling the biomedical literature analysis with semantics um, at a time when we've been seeing an incredible amount of work um, focusing on not using semantics and, and basically using data to drive uh, everything that we ever want to do in, with natural language processing. And so I thought I would just ask that question and, and give a bit of my perspective um, on, on that question uh, through, the, through the kind of projects and experiences that I've had working on, on biomedical uh, literature analysis. So um, I'd like to start, however, with something that's very typical here in Australia. So um, in Australia, it's, it's common to acknowledge the country that we are on. And so I'd like to give the formal acknowledgement of country that we use at RMIT. RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT University respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past and present. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors and the, on the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. 
This is a really important thing that we do in order to acknowledge the Indigenous people um, that have lived on these lands long before um, we have come to live on them. And certainly I've only lived on these lands for a little over 10 years, as you just heard. Um, and so um, I really, you know, really respect the, the history and the culture that has long, long um, been here, long before I was. Okay. So I think um, given the context that we find ourselves in now, um, where we have papers um, proclaiming things like attention is all you need. In other words, that's it. We're done people, right? Why bother? We have everything we need. We've got attention. We need nothing else. Um, and it, it is indeed true that these transformer models um, using attention have achieved state of the art performance on many, many natural language processing tasks, including machine translation, question answering, named entity recognition, natural language interface, uh, inference, and, and many more tasks. And so I think, you know, it's a good moment to maybe ask the question, are we done? You know, can we just sort of tick off natural language processing, um, offer a list of things to do and move on to something else? Um, and maybe you can probably anticipate that my answer to this question is going to be no, um, because I think there's still a lot of problems um, to, to be addressed. But let's talk a little bit about where we're at um, at, at the moment. And also just talk a little bit about the, the technology that, that's underlying this. So what's happening with these transformer models? We have these incredibly complex um, architectures, which essentially allow us to go from data um, to, to an output um, by, by doing very sophisticated um, exploration of the patterns in, in those data sets. And so using huge amounts of data and um, having these layered encoders, we can then build a model, which um, when we then decode allows us to produce um, some corresponding output. And we, we can do this in a way that's cheap, right? Because all we need is data. We don't need annotations. We don't need labels. We can just use um, examples of, 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 thing, of text. And th that can drive the, the inference of a model. And this has really taken over natural language processing, right? This idea that, that we can use um, unlabeled um, um, heaps of text data, large amounts of text data, and, and build a model that's effective for lots of things. Specifically, um, the mechanism of self-attention, which allows us to pay attention to all of the words in a, in a sequence simultaneously and leverage the context in which particular words occur, um, is, is something that has really, really um, lifted the performance of, of models very, very substantially. And so we've seen, um, obviously, the use of machine learning for for decades in natural language processing, um, but in recent years, the use of, of these, uh, these sort of sophisticated architectures and the access to large amounts of data has really, really transformed the way, oh, that's sorry, didn't mean that was not actually meant to be a joke, but anyway, um, the transformers have transformed um, the, the way that, that we approach natural language processing. And um, here's a cute little video that you can also get um, from the Google AI blog, um, which kind of illustrates the idea that basically through the attention mechanism, we're able to um, leverage information from multiple words in the sent sentence in order to encode the representation of, of any particular word in, in the sentence. Okay. And um, I'm sure all of you by now have heard of BERT, which is, which is one of the um, the models that really, really has um, been, become the foundation for almost everything we do in natural language processing these days, um, bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. And I still can't see that window, I'm gonna move that away. Um, so so BERT, what BERT does is it's focusing on, on one half of that kind of transformer picture that I just showed you, where it's really focusing on the encoding piece of it in order to produce representations um, of words. And the advantage that, that BERT has over, over just a, a sort of vanilla transformer um, is that it adds joint conditioning on both the left and the right context in all of the layers and makes use of, of masking in order to kind of simulate this, this um, idea of predicting words in a sequence using the other words in, in the sequence. 
And so it's quite clever in many ways. It, it allows the model to kind of um, um, solve a prediction task by leveraging the, the data itself uh, without having to, to provide separate annotations. Um, and then it adds segment embeddings to support structured structured input. So we have we have actually layers of, of embeddings, not just at the token level, but but at um, at the kind of phrasal level or the sentence level, in order to allow us to tackle things like sent, uh, sentence similarity tasks or question answering tasks, where we have essentially two inputs that we want to be able to to compare and have the model learn from. Um, in order to use a, a BERT representation in the context of, of a downstream natural language processing task, we typically couple it with supervised fine tuning over annotated data. So we take the BERT model that has been derived from large amounts of unannotated data, and then we, we essentially adapt it to the context of a particular um, uh, uh, annotated data set in order to allow us uh, to build a model that tackles a particular task. So, um, as I said, it, one of the key features of, of the BERT model is using a masked language model, so randomly masking words in the sentence and then using the model to try to um, predict them. And so the training of the model involves essentially trying to predict those missing words that, that, have, been, that have been masked. And this allows us to build a representation of each word that's based on the other words in, in the sentence because we're trying to sort of um, guess what's in, that, what's in that missing spot. Now, of course, we don't only want to predict correct tokens when there's a mass token present. And so um, there is a, a game that's, that's done in the, in the training of, of BERT in order to, to um, ensure that we, we are able to uh, predict basically every word in the sentence um, so that so that every word sometimes is is a masked word and we have to we have to predict that and so at the end of the day we we end up with a model which allows us to to um, transform uh, the input sequence into a representation which captures um, the, the the sort of linguistic dependencies between between words in that sentence and as I said earlier, you know, it uses these layers of embeddings, both at the at the token level, um, at the position level, in order to keep track of the actual word order in the sentence, since we know that word order is important in many languages. Um, but also the use of segment embedding, was, which allows us in this case to capture um, two inputs, sentences in, in the context of a single input representation. Okay, so we have the BERT model. Um, before we had BERT, we also had ELMO, which is another language modeling kind of approach. Um, we now have Ernie, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in, in a minute. So we have all these cute little um, Sesame Street characters um, and models that, that are cute, but really, really powerful. And they've kind of spawned a whole, um, uh, a whole collection of models that are that are bit based on the kind of similar principles of, of deep um, um, stacked models and and learning uh, between them based on the neural network uh, principles and training from from unlabeled data. And so we have Roberta and ExcelNet and BART for summarization and GPT-2 and 3 and Longformer to try to capture longer di distance dependencies, Distill BERT to try to uh, reduce the size of these models. Uh, they, we're, we're starting to see, you know, just minor variations basically of, of the same idea, um, all of which have um, really quite impressive performance. And, um, you know, every variation has some advantage over, over the previous model, um, but slowly we're making progress um, on these things. However, there's um, some criticism of, of these models out there because, and, and definitely the, the um, the, the changes that we've seen in performance, thanks to transformer models and, and, and BERT um, is massive, but all of the other sort of incremental developments um, since then seem to be driven more by data and computing resources um, than by actual sort of deep understanding of the natural language processing tasks that, that are being addressed. So the key drivers of performance on these tasks are lots and lots and lots of text, lots and lots of computing resources, 
um, including machines, chips, GPUs, um, and importantly, energy. So, um, you know, the energy costs of running and training these models um, is, is non-trivial because um, the energy usage corresponds to, sorry, the, the CPU usage core or the GPU usage corresponds to thousands of petaflop days um, in order to train a single model. So we're not making our, our models instantly. We're, we're using huge amounts of resources to do it. And if you look at um, the, the kind of top performing models on the leaderboards, um, like glue or super glue, they um, are all coming from industrial research labs, which um, apparently have access to, to huge amounts of compute resources. And so it's been, um, it's been argued that the progress that we're seeing now um, in terms of the state of the art performance of, of, our, of our models is not really research news, but more of an engineering story where we're able to, to access um, these, these massive compute resources and massive amounts of data that some organizations have access to. And that's what's really driving the improvements that we're seeing. So we have to ask, I think, in the context of the, um, you know, these models at the top of the leaderboard and, and really, you know, really outperforming um, every, every benchmark that was set um, prior to, to um, these coming out. Um, from, from Google and from Facebook AI and, and from other um, organizations, Baidu, what in NLP tasks do we have left that, that remain a challenge? Because we've seen that on named entity recognition and on um, <clears throat> natural language inter inference and question answering, the, 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 the systems are actually um, doing extremely well. Excuse me, end of a long day. Um, so the NLP tasks that, that remain a challenge are basically semantic tasks. So semantic pronoun reference tasks, um, such as with the uh, Wino Grande data set, which is based on um, um, mostly pronoun resolution. Also the um, Allen Institute for AI Reasoning Challenge in, in Common Sense Reasoning, there's a data set called ARC. Um, these kinds of, of, of tasks that require essentially semantics to resolve have become, um, are still not completely solved by these models. I'm sorry, <laughs> give me one second to drink some more water. So if we look at, at the examples here, the tree fell down and crashed the roof of, through the roof of my house. Now I have to get it removed versus I have to get it repaired. The re resolution of um, it in these two, two cases is different de if depending on, on what verb is there, right? <clears throat> so it doesn't make sense to, to um, have the roof removed um, because we know that houses have to have, have a roof. Um, and it doesn't make sense to have a, a tree repaired either. Um, but it does make sense to have a roof repaired. So we have to be able to leverage our understanding of the world, world and relationships between them in order to resolve um, things like this. <coughs> and the, the questions at the bottom, like these, these um, sort of science questions are actually questions that are quite easy for um, you know, fifth and sixth graders to do, but are quite challenging for these models to do. So what can we what can we infer from from the challenges um, and the the tasks where where these models are still having having trouble? Well, it's knowledge based tasks, right? It's tasks that require us to understand the relationships between things in the world. So this has led to um, some attempts to incorporate semantics into these into these large language models, and I mentioned Ernie earlier, and that's one example where they've attempted to tackle this problem by adding another layer into the embedding um, structure of, of BERT. And in addition to having the, the token level um, embedding that's, that's inferred through, through the training uh, and the, the sort of phrasal level um, embedding, they've added a layer for entities as well. And so this assumes that you can pre-identify um, um, terms like, in this case, a JK Rowling, 
is masked as 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 an entity day, entity name, and so <clears throat> we're incorporating the structure of the of the entities into the into the information that the model is provided in order to allow the model to to infer. Uh, well, to make use of entity information when it's when it's trying to understand the structure of the sentence and trying to understand the dependencies between the words in the sentence. Another example of this is a model called Kbert, which explicitly integrates hierarchical knowledge into the representation. And so we see in this example at the bottom that Tim Cook is identified not only as an entity, but an entity that belongs specifically to the CEO category, and that is connected um, somehow to the company Apple. And similarly, Beijing is a capital, um, which is um, the capital city of, of, of China. And so capturing these, these relationships between um, entities is incorporated explicitly into the, into the training um, that's done by the model. And both of these um, both of these models end up achieving higher performance on some of these tasks that require um, more semantic information. Other ways that this is is approached is by incorporating knowledge via extra textual information, and um, that can be done, for instance, by concatenating other information that we have. So here's a, an example um, uh, in a document classification task where where they've incorporated information about um, sort of features about the about the um, documents at a, at a kind of higher level, as well as adding in um, embeddings that were learned from a, a knowledge graph of, of author relationships. And uh, so in this case, they've taken the kind of standard BERT model and they've um, just simply concatenated another um, you know, set of vectors to 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 the primary vector, and then and then incorporated that into the classification model directly. Um, in the context of um, LSTMs, um, we've had some we've had some work in the in biomedical co-reference resolution, which involved um, leveraging um, knowledge in in the, in the model itself. So basically. Um, we the the model tries to take advantage of, of knowledge that's related to the current context um, by by folding it into the to the modeling um, directly. And so there's different approaches to doing this, but in both cases, what you know, in all of these cases, what we're trying to do is take advantage of of additional information that we have about the words or about the entities that are that are represented. Um, implicitly or explicitly in, in the text. So of course, if we're going to be leveraging entities and, and background knowledge, we have to ask the question of where does that come from, right? So, you know, if we if we go back to, to this example here, I mean, how did we know that JK Rowling um, was an entity? Well, so in some sense, we're assuming that we already have NLP models that can do a good job of doing named entity recognition or concept recognition. And, um, in order to incorporate hierarchical information, then we have to we have to take advantage of, of concept normalization or enti entity linking um, methods, and ultimately relate those entities into existing linguistic and, and ontological resources. Um, so some of the some of the work that's been done has been quite shallow in some ways. Um, it's it's leveraged dictionaries and and not done anything particularly sophisticated. And, and other work um, assumes that there is a sort of precursor NLP model in a pipeline um, that's going to be doing the, the, the work of recognizing the entities. For us in the biomedical domain, um, this is actually a, a nice opportunity because we've been working on concept and, and entity recognition and linking and normalization for many, many years. And so we actually have um, very, very um, rich resources in, in terms of lexical, semantic, linguistic, and ontological knowledge that we can incorporate. And in, if we take a little bit of a, an aside, um, you know, there's been a series of work that, that um, I've been involved with in trying to recognize ontology concepts specifically in the biomedical literature um, using a resource called the Craft Corpus, the Colorado Richly Annotated Full Text Corpus, um, which has um, 
has a number of different ontologies annotated over um, the biomedical literature in a very deep way. And we can leverage this to help us um, learn how to approach the problem of, of recognizing um, biomedical concepts in, in context of, of the literature. And of course, this is a little bit um, trickier than, than simple um, dictionary lookup due to lexical variation that, that we find, but due to the scale of, of the, the vocabularies that we're working with. So for instance, the gene ontology has over 50,000 terms in it. Um, you know, building a classification model uh, that, that works in that space is, is, is quite challenging and requires its, its own approach to, to um, the structured representation of, of the data. Um, so having flexible linguistic matching is, is perhaps a more viable approach so that we can accommodate for um, not just the, the known synonyms of a particular term, but also the, the natural linguistic variation that occurs in the text. Okay, so in the scientific context, we've recognized that we um, probably want to, to take advantage of the data and the, the domain specific resources that we have in order to not only leverage these, these uh, amazing language models um, like BERT, but to actually um, ad adapt them to the, the language of the scientific domains. And so we've seen uh, a number of, of resources that have come out, which really take BERT and um, essentially just reproduce it but adapted for the particular kinds of texts that, that we would encounter in the biomedical context. So PubMed, BERT, and BioBERT, and CyBERT, all taking advantage of PubMed as, its, as the primary resource for, um, for inferring the language model. Um, KEMBERT and KEMUBERT, um, both looking at, at um, um, chemical uh, literature on the one hand and chemical patents on the other. Um, and so on. EHR BERT looking at, at um, um, electronic health record data, clinical text, and, and so on. And so we have in these models a, 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 an a, a adaptation of the basic BERT um, model, but still not quite reaching to that point of having semantics, which is a missed opportunity that we have now seen some people starting to take advantage of. So um, there are, there are now language models which um, build on the BERT or BioBERT or PubMed BERT or CyBERT, take your pick, and they, they add some semantic knowledge into those models um, in, in various different ways, um, sometimes via an embedding layer, um, sometimes via specifically trained embeddings um, that leverage a knowledge graph embedding objective. So different approaches to doing it, um, leveraging synonyms, leveraging semantic types, um, the different approaches have different pros and cons, but the basic idea in, in each of these cases is to leverage the information that we have in the Unified Medical Language System, um, which, is, which is an amazing resource, uh, connecting a number of different vocabularies together and um, really showing that, that we can incorporate um, lexical semantic knowledge into our models in order to, to help us um, enrich the representations uh, that come out of the, the, the data itself with background knowledge. And to my mind, this kind of approach is, is really worthwhile. I have often been heard to say what I'm telling you now, which is why would we learn, try to learn things using an unsupervised model when we already know them? And the UMLS is a really good example of something that um, captures a lot of knowledge that we have in, in, the, in the biomedical domain. And so um, it's great to be able to take advantage of that. And, and there's clear um, evidence that, that doing that um, has, has benefit. However, we still have further need for, for additional background knowledge. So um, the, the kind of ontological knowledge and the, the sort of relational knowledge that's captured in the UMLS um, doesn't quite capture everything that, that we want to be able to capture. 
And if we look at some examples, especially in reference resolution or anaphor resolution, um, there are some really challenging examples which require um, more than, than just ontological knowledge. So over here, um, we have a couple of examples from, from some work that my student Yao Yang Fan has been doing. Um, on the left side, we have examples from chemical patents, on the right side from recipes, where um, it turns out that in order to kind of resolve things like the combined organic layer over here or the organic layer, you have to have some understanding of the nature of chemicals and their sort of um, their properties in order to, to work out exactly what that layer um, refers to. Um, for the recipes, likewise, um, you know, you, you need to understand that um, biscuits and dough are connected in order to be able to, to understand that when we use the phrase the dough um, uh, in step three, that it's referring to the dough of the biscuits, right? The biscuits um, is, it are, are made out of dough, and, and so we need to be able to do that. And similarly with cheese, um, we need to know that mozzarella and parmesan are cheese, um, and, uh, and in order to make sense of, of, of an of a instruction like this one, to make sure that the cheese is covering. Um, similarly, we have examples down here from, from um, uh, the Kraft co-reference data set, which is an extension of the Kraft corpus I mentioned earlier. Um, which adds in co-reference information. And, um, and so to be able to resolve the pronouns it's here, um, you, you need some quite sophisticated understanding, not only of the linguistic relationships that are, that are captured there, but also the, the kinds of entities that are, that are captured there and specifically what can have a mutant form. So, um, so there are certain things, certain kinds of things, biological entities that can have, have mutant forms and, and others that can't. So arguably in order to solve those kinds of problems, we need to take further advantage um, of, of, of background knowledge. Um, I'll just mention um, the, the approaches that, that are, are um, um, increasingly being used for information extraction. So um, named entity recognition and relation classification can be approached using, using our, our deep learning methods. And, and we did some work a number of years ago um, already trying to, to leverage not only um, kind of word level representation, but, but also to incorporate um, conditional random fields, which have had um, very, very good utility in the context of named entity recognition, um, but to fold them into um, a model where we do joint learning across the relation classification and the named entity recognition. Again, recognizing that relations are heavily dependent and typically defined by, um, by, by the entities. In this work, we're, we're, we're not using um, um, semantic information, um, but uh, an obvious extension to, to this would be to incorporate that sort of information. Okay, so um, we can leverage the information extraction to, to help us transform our, our, um, our text into, into relational information. Um, but in order to do that, we not only need to take advantage of ontological information, but we need to, to have kind of more instance level information as well. And um, so we not only need to know that chemicals in general treat diseases, um, we, all, we need to know more specific things like ACE inhibitors treat hypertension. And we also need to know what are ACE inhibitors. So we need to have that kind of ontological information um, to, to connect um, a particular drug to a particular category of, of drugs. And so in order to, to understand the relationships um, that, that, um, that are relevant in the case of co-reference, for instance, or reference resolution, we, we actually need to, to understand not only the higher level, um, the, the types of relationships that can exist, but actually the specific examples of those. And so we can leverage named entity recognition and relation extraction methods to help us um, basically move from having ontological information to having instance level relational information. We can end up with this nice kind of virtuous cycle where we start with text, we, we, we then um, extract kind of structured relationships um, out of the text using our, our named entity recognition and relation extraction models. 
and um, and then capture that that um, more instance level information ship information, which we can then build on for to produce knowledge that then becomes the background knowledge for our, our subsequent analysis steps. So, um, you know, the, the basic idea with, with these information extraction models is to take a sentence, you know, like this one um, and transform it into a kind of structured representation, um, not only of the, um, of the particular event that's expressed, in this case, an interaction event that's expressed in the sentence, but also to, to characterize it at a higher kind of classification level into um, a particular type of, of event. By doing this, we, we are able to take the resource that we have in the literature and, and really transform it into a set of, of facts that, that um, become knowledge for, for all sorts of things. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, going beyond NLP. So, you know, that we focus a lot on trying to extract the information um, out of, of text, but I want to, to, and we sort of see that as the end goal, you know, we've named entity recognition, relation extraction, that's our end goal. Um, but I guess I'd like to encourage you to think a little bit about going beyond the NLP and um, really trying to think about making knowledge available and particularly um, trying to make knowledge fair. Now, for those of you who've um, not heard of FAIR, FAIR is a collection of principles for scientific data management, which is really aimed at um, biological researchers, primarily focusing on the use of identifiers and standardized protocols, basically for sharing data. And their focus has been on structured data. Um, but I believe that NLP has a really important role to play in making our scientific knowledge FAIR findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'd like to just talk you through how we're doing that a little bit already. I'm gonna spend some time on findability because from my perspective, this is kind of the, the place where we have um, the, the biggest role to play right now. And where um, we did a bit of work during, during COVID to try to really think through how we could leverage NLP to help make knowledge or more specifically information findable. And um, this came out in the context of, of COVID-19 that uh, scientists kind of realized that there's all this information out there about COVID-19. And um, even in, you know, this was an article that was published in, in Science Magazine in, in May of 2020. So not too far into the pandemic where there was already a huge amount of research that was coming out about COVID-19. But scientists were really, really having trouble keeping track of it. And so the information that was relevant to diagnosing, treating, managing COVID-19 was just not findable, right? It wasn't in any structured form. It was, it was very difficult to find. The only resource for this information was, was in the, the biomedical literature not even necessarily the published biomedical literature could have been in archive or med archive as well. And um, so I kind of jokingly say that, you know, science finally discovered text mining after, you know, 20 years of, of research. Um, congratulations, we exist, yay. Um, but it was the first time that I think scientists kind of really realized that, oh my goodness, you know, we can't just go to PubMed and type in a few, a few standard queries. Um, we need to do something a little bit different. And I think for, on the flip side, um, people who work in, in search kind of also realize that maybe search wasn't gonna solve this problem either, at least not traditional IR. <coughs> and so, you know, what, what happens in traditional search where, uh, well, we have a targeted query, you know, we have very kind of specific information need that, that a user defines. We type that keyword, um, the set of keywords into a search box, we hit enter. Um, we get back a, a, a list of, 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 of papers that may or may not be relevant. We scan through them, we decide which ones that we want to get, get uh, that we think are interesting and we kind of um, we open one we individually open them individually and we keep track of them. It's a lot of work that goes into this. And at the end of the day, we may still not have found anything relevant. And if we think about the kind of um, standard approach that, that biomedical people 
utilize um, biomedical researchers utilize when they when they do querying of PubMed, it's typically quite structured. So so they have very specific concepts that they're that they're looking for um, in particular combinations. And in particular, they 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 use um, they tend to use something called uh, Pico, the patient uh, intervention um, control and and outcome um, model. And so they're actually looking for, for papers that, that have to do with a particular population or a particular disease, a particular intervention that they're interested in. And it's very targeted. And if you wind your head back to, you know, May or even March of 2020, we didn't know what we were looking for. The only thing that we knew was that it was COVID-19, but we didn't, we didn't know anything else really about it. We didn't know what drugs might be relevant to treat it. We didn't know what interventions would be relevant. We didn't know what to look for. And so this kind of very targeted structured querying um, wasn't gonna work in that context. So um, we developed a system called COVID-C, the Scientific Evidence Explorer for COVID, um, which had a kind of different idea, which was to, to support exploration of the literature um, rather than searching of the literature, because we didn't, want to expect that users would know what they were looking for exactly. So we wanted to have a way to surface the content of the literature to help people find what they're looking for without knowing what they're looking for, if you kind of get what I mean. And the way we approached that um, was to utilize that, that notion, PICO, that I mentioned earlier, um, but to pre-identify the, the, the relevant concepts for, for PICO. So rather than knowing that you were looking for a particular patient, we actually went in and tried to identify the patients that were mentioned in each article, the interventions that were mentioned, the outcomes that were mentioned, and tried to characterize those. And then basically by building uh, an information extraction kind of approach, we were able to, to um, visualize the content of, of, of the articles. And specifically, we leveraged um, some work by Byron Wallace and colleagues, um, which, which supports the uh, identification of, of these PICO uh, phrases in, in the document. And then we layered it with our, our unified medical language system um, concepts. And so we created these things that we call um, uh, PICO concepts. And so we actually look for outcome phrases that contain particular mesh terms within them. So in this example, we have hospitalization and we have mortality. And, um, and then we map those into um, PICO concepts where we have hospitalization connected to outcome and mortality connected to outcome. And we basically, you know, try to identify, we pre-identified all of the, 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 the PICO phrases and all of the concepts within them, and then created these PICO concepts, um, which we then used uh, to, to structure the information um, that, that was in the literature. And so we found these relationships between population concepts and intervention concepts and intervention concepts and outcome, con outcome concepts. And then very simply, um, use that to, to drive a visualization, which would allow people to explore rather than to search. So let me show you what I mean. Um, so we, we used a Sankey diagram where we leveraged the relational structure. So co-occurrence, simple co-occurrence, you didn't have time to do much more, <laughs> um, where, where we had uh, population concepts um, on one axis, intervention concepts and outcome concepts on the other axis, and then um, had a relation between, um, between two, two concepts in, in each of those axes if there was a co-occurrence in an article. So for instance, um, if there's an article here, there was, there was one article that connected the gastrointestinal tact, tract to quarantine, and, um, and you could click on that link, and this is the actual article that, that discussed um, those two things together. And this gives a visual way of exploring the content of, of a document collection that comes in response to a query, rather than assuming that um, you, know, you can scan the titles or the, or the um, abstracts quickly enough to, to get a sense of, of, of what's in there. This really kind of gives a visual overview of the, of the collection of documents. 
building on some very simple NLP, right? So just the concept recognition and co-occurrence, nothing more. We also added in some topic modeling. So we, we um, tried to, to identify the kind of themes that were um, retrieved in a particular, in a particular in response to a particular search and um, use that again to help a user um, identify the kind of the concepts that were, were that were joining together and the terminology that was arising and surfacing in, in the collection to allow them to go back and refine their search query to find something that would be interesting and, and add it in. Um, in fact, I skipped over this slide, but maybe I'll come back to it. So the idea was that, you know, um, in a typical search paradigm, you're kind of honing in on the literature that you're that you're interested in. In an exploratory paradigm, what you're doing is actually you spend some time kind of looking around a particular um, part of the of the information space and you find something that piques your interest. And that might bring you to a new query, which brings you actually to a completely different search space. And so the idea was that by, by trying to, by pre-processing the literature and trying to give people a view of the literature that surfaced concepts for them, it might allow them to move between these different parts of the information space. Okay. Um, and then we also gave word cloud kind of overviews so that people could very quickly um, get a sense of what, what an article was about without necessarily having to go and read, you know, complete sentences in order to get that sense. And um, importantly, leveraging the, the um, entities and the concepts that we could pre-identify using MeSH so that, you know, things like E. coli um, are treated as a phrase, statistically significant is treated as a phrase rather than as individual words um, in, and leveraging the kind of conceptual um, representation. Okay, this was very basic, um, but it was a sort of step in the direction of trying to, to sort of recognize that we could, we could utilize our, our biomedical NLP um, capabilities to, to help facilitate access to the information in a different way than, than we typically do. And we could be, um, you know, doing higher, using hierarchical information about the concepts and using those U UMLS relations in order to help us organize this in, in more effective ways. Lots of things we could be doing using perhaps um, document, sorry, discourse structure in the, in the document to help us understand what's, what's given information, what's new information and, and so on. But um, the general paradigm that, that, that we've kind of proposed here is, is really about having a different way, um, supporting a different way of exploring the literature beyond just search. Okay, that was my little aside on COVID-C, uh, but coming back to, to the point about FAIR, um, you know, we, we can really leverage NLP to help uh, find biomedical information in, in different ways um, than we could by using a search engine. And we can, we can do that in increasingly sophisticated ways by adding things like negation detection, by incorporating multi-document summarization, by um, adding in assessment of the quality of particular evidence, which is work that we're, we're, we're also doing at the moment, and really leveraging NLP to, to not just um, you know, solve sort of obvious kind of um, entity and, and relation extraction um, tasks, but to, to, to support finding information in a way that supports user needs. And so go, going beyond just kind of structuring the information that's in there, but thinking about how people want to use that information and for, for what purposes. And I think NLP has a really important role to play. I wanted to talk just briefly about the other elements of, of FAIR. So accessibility is one of the, the key, key factors there. And um, we're lucky, again, in the biomedical domain because we have um, and in the literature space, because we have PubMed IDs and we have um, digital object identifiers and we have the National Library of Medicine e-utilities and we have a number of these, of these resources that just make it kind of a no-brainer for us to get accessibility um, in, in, our, in our methods. For us, I think interoperability is, is another core one. So findability and interoperability 
if we're if we're doing information extraction from from the literature, we want to to do that in a way that targets standardized identifiers, semantic types that are kind of shared and agreed upon, and that allows us to connect into the biological databases because this then is going to give us our hook into getting knowledge that we can leverage in the context of our of our um, NLP models and our, our large language models. And so um, if we're if we're you if we're just to you know give an example, if we're doing named entity recognition that targets particular entity types that we can map into um, into entree gene or into um, uniprot and we can find proteins that are that are in uniprot and we're pointing into the database identifiers, then we can incorporate information about those entities, um, which reflects biological understanding. And so combining, using NLP to, to structure the information that's, um, that's in the literature in, a, in the same you know, semantic language um, that, that the databases are, are utilizing means that we can connect together the unstructured information in the text with the structured information, which is which is already existing in the in the biological databases, and create this this virtuous cycle where we have um, gaps in the biolog in the coverage of the biological databases being filled in by NLP, and the information that's captured in those in those databases providing background knowledge, which can help us with filling that semantic gap that we have in our, in our NLP models. And so we can, we can sort of increasingly um, improve the, the sort of semantic understanding that's captured in our NLP models by, by connecting the dots between the two. In terms of reusability, um, again, FAIR, findability, accessibility, reusability, interoperability, and reusability. Um, we have standards which allow us to capture annotations, um, which then facilitate reuse of, of that. So we have standards such as BioC. Um, the W3C has an open annotation standard, which is really about semantic web representation. We have um, UEMA, the Unstructured Information Management Architecture, which defines a particular set of data structures essentially for, for um, capturing annotations. We are probably all familiar with BRAT and ANN files and A1 and A2 formats and the CONAL formats. And you know the fact that we have all kind of agreed on how to represent the information that we're trying to capture in, in the text in a standardized way allows us to share that um, in, in, in meaningful ways and allows us to, to explore um, you know, layering of information. So if we, as long as we have um, tools that are, are targeting perhaps different information, but using the same underlying representation, we can think about bringing them together. And that's, um, you know, a strategy that, that, that we can leverage in, in many different contexts. Um, okay, and then going beyond FAIR, which again, FAIR, you know, NLP tasks are, are a good goal in their own right but we can go beyond them and think about, about FAIR principles in, in the context of, of transforming the literature into, into um, you know, uh, well-managed data. Going beyond FAIR even, we can think about the implications of, of NLP in this context. And I wanted to give a quick example um, from, some, from some clinical uh, work that we've been doing where we've been able to show that by going through and, and capturing very targeted um, entities and relations or concepts and relations that are relevant to um, a particular task, in this case, it's invasive fungal infection. I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry there. Um, it doesn't really matter what we're annotating. What I, what I wanted to show you was that we've been doing some experiments where we um, compare a simple bag of words model with um, um, a, a very, very simple approach to uh, learning a, a concept recognizer and a relation extractor from annotated data. And then we compare with the gold standard annotations as well. And when we do that, we find that um, 
um, a, a, the simple bag of words model for our particular classification task um, gets about 0.85 AUC using only the gold standard annotation. So only the information, not the, not the annotations of the, of, the, of the classification task, but the, um, the entities and relations that have been annotated over the data, um, we can get 100% performance, you know, one AUC. Um, on, on our classification task. And, and then when we use our very simple NLP in this, in this um, um, approach to pre-identify the entities and relations of interest, we get almost close to perfect, uh, you know, perfect performance. And the, the, really the point here is that by pre-processing the text into the entities and relations of interest for the problem, the clinical problem we're trying to solve, um, we can we can do a much better job of um, focusing the attention of the model on the information in the in the text that's relevant. The bag of word model basically gets distracted by the fact that there's a whole bunch of bunch of noise. So we're by doing some simple work um, uh, to to focus the model attention on only the words that are relevant to the classification task. We can get um, you know really really excellent performance. Also by um, leveraging NLP, we can start thinking about how to deal with some of the explainability questions that people are having in other related areas. So I've been I'm doing some collaboration with people who work on computer vision image processing in the context, um, in this case of, of um, particular eye diseases. And by using NLP, um, to try to drive generation of medical reports which describe those images, we're actually kind of giving a window into what the, the computer vision models are doing because we are producing language that describes what's in these images. And so we're starting to fill the, the gap between the computer vision models and the, and the sort of diagnosis by illustrating, elucidating effectively um, through the language, what's going on in the images, because we're, we're picking words that describe characteristics of the image. Um, and that allows us to start tackling the explainability um, gap that most, that many computer vision models have. And um, just to kind of, you know, kind of bring everything to, to a close, and I realize I'm out of time <laughs> and left no time for questions, but hopefully uh, we could do a little bit. Um, I just wanted to kind of paint the sort of big picture of that, of that virtuous cycle that I was talking about, how by combining um, ontological information um, with our, with our um, information that's extracted from the literature and structured information um, that's available in our biological databases, we can build this sort of representation of our knowledge. We can combine it um, with actual, with biological data that's coming out of genomic data, experimental data, um, and we can, we can support an analysis that, that crosses these different um, kinds of, of data and really leverages the, 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 the power of, of the knowledge network in the context of, of the data. And this is a picture, by the way, that, that um, I made for a talk I gave 10 years ago in 2012. And the story has not changed, okay? So like, really, this is still a vision that we haven't yet realized, um, but I think we're getting closer to realizing it. And I think we're start by bringing together the knowledge and the semantics with the, um, with the, the NLP, and then bringing it together with these other kinds of data resources, we're gonna see some, some really significant advances. And so just try to think about you know, NLP going beyond NLP. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna, gonna leave it there. Why bother enabling biomedical literature analysis with semantics? Well, hopefully I've convinced you that, it, that semantics is critical to deeper processing, better processing of the biomedical literature but also because explicit semantics allows us to interoperate the information that is in that literature with other data because knowledge is inherently relational. So if we don't capture the relational structure that's implicit and conveyed by the text, then we're missing, missing a really important part of it. 
because those semantic representations are fair and ultimately because semantics facilitates the analysis, interpretation and discovery. And so I think, you know, to, to sum up my talk here, literature represents scientific knowledge, knowledge begets knowledge, and biomedical literature analysis drives science. So you all are here because you're doing science. Thanks. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen, that was fantastic. Glad you liked it. Open up the chat too, so if somebody's shy and wants to put a question in the chat. Um, if nobody has a question, I was wondering, um, so we've been developing all of these different NER, RE, entity linking models. Um, and because now, as you had said, their scientists are realizing they, they kind of need us. Have, are there ways or directions that you're also thinking of how we're able to port these into additional domains? I mean, in the biomedical space, but um, when I meet people, their, their first question is, can you extract my entities? Um, and can you do it cheaply? Um, yeah, no, I mean, look, that's a really good point. Like we, we tend to approach things at a very general level, right? And, and um, certainly um, whenever, whenever I start interacting with a new collaborator um, who's in the clinical space, the, you're exactly right. They they always want to to know what we know or what we can help them with in 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 their particular problem area. I think the 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 thing is that that um, a lot of the methods that we're developing are quite straightforwardly adaptable to those specific contexts. So, for instance, um, we're we're doing some work in Alzheimer's disease, and you know when you fundamentally break Alzheimer's disease down, what are people looking at? They're looking at genes, they're looking at proteins, they're looking at molecular pathways, they're looking at drugs, they're looking at, you know, basic biological interactions. And, and so while we, we clearly want to do things that, that take the specific context of the disease into consideration, the methods themselves don't necessarily need to change that much, at least not as a starting point, right? We, the, the way we tailor it to Alzheimer's disease is by subselecting literature that's, that we know is directly relevant to Alzheimer's disease. And, but then to go the next level, we can actually bring in that external knowledge that we have, you know, first of all, like what, what are the genes that are already known to be involved and, you know, look for, look for information that's relevant to, to, to those genes and, and essentially snowball um, from there. So start with what you know, and then, and then go out from there, but the methods themselves are the same. You know, we're not, we're not, Genes are genes are genes, right? So even though there's some specific set of genes that, that we might want to focus our kind of inference or, or reasoning over, the, the core idea of taking the literature and transforming it into a set of entities and relations is really not very different in different disease contexts. Thank you. Okay, may I ask a question? Uh, Okay, uh, thank you so much, Karen, for a uh, for great talk. I, I really enjoyed the idea of uh, COVID C exploring instead of searching when we were not sure about the exact thing we're looking for. I, I, I have a question about like uh, bird and language models introduced. Um, I, I could see there are two, two different approaches like leveraging um, uh, ontologies or knowledge graphs like UMLS inside um, inside language models, or fine tuning these language models on biomedical texts like PubMed. Okay, so do you have any like um, um, uh, have you worked with these two different approaches? Which one do you have any experience, and which one could be more effective? Maybe as uh, um, like spending more time on uh, on better fine tuning could result in a better result or, or kind of leveraging UMLS or other structured 
uh, knowledge bases could be a better result for different NLP tasks like question answering, like entity extraction. And yeah, I, so, so uh, okay, so the, the sad reality is that we haven't done as much in terms of incorporating the, the ontological and relational knowledge into these models as we should. <laughs> and uh, like, there's been a lot of, of emphasis on, on um, tuning these models to, to the domain by, by using the, the text from the domain. And, um, you know, it seemed like I, I had that whole list of them, right? You know, it seemed like there was a new one coming out um, that used a slightly different combination and a slightly different um, approach to, 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 to training. Um, and actually, which one works better in which context really depends on the task that you're, that you're trying to solve. What we found, in fact, like with our work with the, the um, chemical patents and the representation is that tokenization uh, is the first thing you need to fix <laughs> because, because chemicals have quite a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of different token structure than, than normal text does. And so we found that just by having a, a domain aware tokenizer could produce a much more effective um, mm -hmm. representation in the model. Now that has nothing to do with semantics, but that does have to do with understanding the relationship between um, the domain and the text that, you, that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in a lot of the context where uh, clinical text, for instance, um, where there are a lot of sort of, um, you know, numbers and um, short phrases and abbreviations, we actually need to deal with that kind of in a very explicit way if we're going to have a reliable model because these you know these these the words themselves are so heavily ambiguous um, because because they're short and they're and they're noisy so right at that front end we you know there there's there's work to be done but I think we're not going to be able to um, really tackle some of the more complex language processing problems unless we incorporate semantics. And uh, that's where we're seeing people, people work now because, you know, as, as I kind of tried to say, we're sort of hitting a, uh, a ceiling perhaps in terms of the performance of, of um, the BERT-based models that will only, like that, that ceiling's on only gonna, we're only gonna break through it either with more compute and more data, which we don't have, right? I mean, we have limited quantities of publicly accessible data in the biomedical domain. We have, PubMed is, is, is huge, but it's not anywhere near the size of the web, right? We're, ne we're just never gonna have <laughs> that amount of data. So maybe we've hit a ceiling there. Where are we gonna get our next boost? It's gonna be by, by being smarter rather than having more data. And so, yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's where we need to kind of leverage. Okay, thank you. I see a question in the chat. Um, shall I try to try to go for that one? Uh, when you were talking about the knowledge-based data analysis, how can we improve the role of the data network? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so um, at the moment, there have been, I, I talked about one particular paper that I'm aware of where they've tried to go into the databases and use the information in the data to feed back into the, into the NLP model. Um, and that was the Lee et al. Um, co-reference work. And um, I think that's an, that's, I think there's a lot more that could be done there. So that, you know, that's an example of where they've, they've tried to leverage um, in relational information that, that's um, in a structured resource to improve the represent the word level representation in, in the language model. Um, but I think this idea of bringing together knowledge with, with data um, is, is again, something where, where um, there's a lot more that could be done. And how to do that? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I encourage you to help us figure out how to do that. Um, there's different ways of doing it. I mean, whether that means that we're, we're building um, models that, that leverage a knowledge graph in, in some way independently of the text and then in, incorporate that into the text. So there's you know, quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of work on graph embeddings now. Um, can, we, can we leverage graph embeddings in combination with the language model 
um, representations? I suspect so. Um, how do we do that? What's the most effective way to do that? I don't know. I think that you know there's going to be some um, experimental research that needs to happen to to work out the best way to do that. Uh, so yeah, I can mention one work that we've done um, where we're looking at uh, biological networks in the con context of cancer. And by using um, what's called a visible neural network, where you actually basically constrain the, um, the links in the, in the neural network to correspond to known biological pathways. And then we fold that in with gene expression data. Um, that, that has benefits for, for the predictive tasks that we're doing in, in that case. And that's not an NLP. So that, that's work that's being done by my, stu my student, Gurab Goshroy. Um, and he's simply looking at the biological networks and, and in combination with, with uh, the gene expression data. And, you know, could we leverage text in that context? Most likely, we're not yet. Okay, I think I've gone way over time. I really apologize. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And uh, I will stick around for a little while and listen to some of the talks. Great, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so uh, the next um, session uh, will be uh, like presentation sessions where we're going to start uh, with, uh, uh, with a paper presentation exploring representations for singular and multi-concept relations for biomedical name entity normalization. I think Clint, you're going to uh, present, yes? Yes. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. And uh, the remaining two papers will be presented after um, after the break. Uh, okay, uh, can can you share your slides or? Uh, yes, we're we're presenting my uh, paper now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, can we see the screen? Uh, yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then when can I start? Yeah, you can start with this right away. Thank you. Okay. Um, something's funky is happening here. Okay. Oh, uh, well, greetings, everyone. My name is Clint Cuffey, and I'll be presenting to you our work entitled Exploring Contextual Term Representations for Singular and Multi Content Relations for Biomedical Name Entity Normalization. So this is a brief outline and the order I'll be covering topics in. Uh, first, we'll be covering a little bit of introduction. So we're naming generalization, talking about the data. Um, then we're gonna go into our methods we use for NEN, uh, the results and then brief and error analysis, and then a uh, con conclusion. So what is name entity normalization? So this is the process of linking terms and unstructured text to concepts within the knowledge base or an ontology. So in the bottom here, if you look at this figure, you can see we have two chemical terms, naloxone and conidine. And these are being linked to the appropriate candidate concepts. Um, these, these are mesh terms that come from the National Library of Medicine. Um, so within this task, we have two types of relations. We have singular relations and complex relations. Um, the previous example that I showed you at the bottom left here is a singular relation where we have a single term being linked to a single concept within an ontology. Um, but if you, look to, if you look to the bottom right, you'll see a single term here. This is known as a complex relation that's being linked to multiple candidate concepts within an ontology. So in this case, we'll have uric acid being linked to the, the first term, and then the salts within this term being linked to the second con con concept. Um, so let's take a look at the data a little bit. So we use four biomedical data sets for name entity normalization. We use the BC5 CDR, the BC7 T2 CDR, the BC7 T2 LM Chem, and the NCBI disease data set. Then each of these contain chemical and disease terms, which we then again map to the medical subject headings, um, which are the, the mesh concepts. The table to the right shows you um, statistics over all four of these data sets. So we have the, the type of documents that the data sets consist of, um, the number of documents, the number of passages, the number of unique terms, the number of unique concepts, and also the averages among, among these types of representations of, of data too. So if we take a look at the, one of the instances within the data, they're all represented the same way. Um, this is a XML formatted instance of um, an NEN uh, data instance. Here we have what's called the, the term context. So this is the context or the sentence that the term occurs in. 
So given this uh, instance, we have the term fabiotidine that we want to map to its kind of concept here. Um, if you look, this is the first word within this context of the first sentence within this, this, this passage. And we'll just be linking that term given this passage to this appropriate concept here. So this data set is comprised of two types of data, as we have as mentioned before. Um, the previous example that I've shown you is a singular root relation, um, where we just map a single root, single term to a single concept, um, right? Uh, we also have what's called a composite mention as well, too, within this data. So this is a, a complex relation where we take a single term and we map it to um, multiple candidate concepts within our ontology. And this is denoted as a composite mention within the data. So for each composite mention, there may or may not be what's denoted an individual mention in the data too. What this entails is it's the individual mention of the composite composite mention that we previously seen. If we take a look at this, this is uh, this term HCFCS123 is the first term, first two words within the, the composite term. And that links to the first concept within that, uh, that, that term. And subsequently, the bottom one, HCFCS124, is the first and last words within that term that link to the second uh, concept within that composite mention term. So these are the individual mentions of that composite term. Um, so we have two types of models. Um, one is a singular relation model. So what this does is it takes the singular, the general singular relation data and the individual mentions of a given composite mention, and we train on this in order to perform an, a name entity normalization. Similarly, for a complex relational model, we train on the singular relation data in addition to the composite mention data as well. We do not train on the individual mentions of the composite mention for a complex relational model. So getting into the bit of the methods, we have a three-layer neural network-based architecture, and we use the BioBert base encoder in order to derive embedding representations for each of our terms. So in this instance, we have the context naloxone versus the anti-hypertensive effects of clonidine. We want to um, map this term here to its appropriate candidate concept. We then pass it through the BERT tokenizer and the BERT language model encoder, and we developed in the term extraction layer, which um, represents that term we want to classify into a perfect candidate concept using three input representations. So we either take the average of all the subword embeddings of that token, the first subword embedding of that token, or the last subword embedding of that to token as representations for any end classification. So with this, we also want to explore how much context is sufficient in order to generate a high quality embedding for each of our input representations. So we use three methods to do this as well. The first method is given we want to classify this, this term acetetrin into its appropriate candidate concept. We take the, the sequence that the term occurs in, and this instance is everything in green. So what this looks like is we would take this green sentence here and we would pass it through a model and extract a representation for acetetrin using three or three input representation methods and then subsequently classify it into its appropriate candidate comp concept. So next we want to explore is more context better. So in this instance, we would take the sequence before, the sequence containing, and then after the sequence containing the, the, the token we want to classify. And what this looks like is we would just take these three sentences and pass it as a contiguous string of text. And then once again, extract the representation embeddings for the term acetetrin using our three methods, and then subsequently classify them into its appropriate candidate concept. And then lastly, we want to see is more, again, is more context better. So in this instance, we would maximize the context by taking all four of these two sentences and then passing it into our model to see, once again, is this a better quality or higher quality representation for that term acetetrin? Um, and then use the, each of the three methods for, for classification. So given this, we have two types of output classifications for name entity normalization where we classify singular relations and then complex relations as well too. And how we do this is we consider the singular relation a multi-class classification and we use categorical cross entropy to do this. So given a singular instance, it will classify one as a, as a um, predicted class among all, all other classes. And then for our complex relate relation models, we consider this a multi-label classification task. And we use by the binary cross entropy function with the sigmoid activation at the final output and the inflection point of the sigma function to perform that classification. And with this, we would classify each class independently from one another. So therefore we can have 
more than one class being represented for a, a given term, um, uh, classifying to its appropriate candidate con concept or concepts. So getting into a little bit of the results. So what we're showing you here is the results among all of our input representation methods, our term aggregation methods, and the output classification methods here. Um, we re record our, um, sorry, we evaluate our model using precision recall in F1. Um, each of these columns, with, uh, sorry, correspond to the different four data sets that we have. And then if you look at the first column, this corresponds to the, the input represent representation. So either first averaging or taking the last token embedding of that term. Um, and then if you look at these columns with respect to here, these are the, the different types of term context aggregation methods. Um, I'm specifically focusing on the input representation and we're going to just combine the best results among these in order to, for you to easily see. So among our input representation methods, um, I've highlighted them all in here. This shows that among the averaging first and last, averaging always performs best among the, these three methods. Um, subsequently, first performs second, and then last performs last. So I'm going to show you from here on out just the results based on our averaging among all of our different methods for term context aggregation and the output classification. So if we consider term context, um, there is no best type of term context aggregation method that we utilize. It solely depends on the classification that we're doing, be it singular relation or complex re re relation. Um, so if we look at this, compare these two between singular and complex relations, um, we can see that singular relations, given that with respect to the context, it performs best when it only utilizes that the, the sequence the term occurs in. Three out of a four biomedical data sets um, perform best to just using this, this method for context aggregation. Meanwhile, the NCBI disease data set needed more context. So we needed this, the sequence before and after in addition to the sequence containing the term we want to classify in order to achieve the best evaluation performance. If we were to look at the results between classifying singular relations and then complex relations, we can see that in general, our precision recall and F1 scores are higher on average when classifying more complex relations. So what this means is that classifying um, the complex relations does better on average than just classifying the singular re relations alone. And furthermore, with relation with respect to the um, the type of um, term context aggregation method that we're using, if we take a look at this, we see the inverse relationship between the two of these, where we only need the sequence containing the term for singular relations. However, in the complex relations, it says that to achieve the greatest evaluation for performance, we need more context here. Um, for the three out of the four data sets here. Meanwhile, the BC7T2 CDR needed the full context in order to achieve the highest evaluation performance. Um, so our best methods overall for all of our um, input representations, term context aggregation, and um, output classifications is we know that averaging performs best for our input representations. Um, and with respect to the singular versus complex, the complex does better on average. And then with the complex relationships, we know that we need more context in order to derive the highest quality embeddings to perform the entity norm normalization. Okay, so we compare our results to previous work. Um, we compare it to the Viatrack et al. study done in 2020. Um, this is a study that they've done, that they utilized, um, sorry, they classified singular relations for the BC5 CDR data set. And these are the results here. Um, we compare this to our one-to-many approach, uh, which is our singular relation model, and our, um, sorry, our one-to-one, and the one-to-many, which is our complex relation model. We can see here that we achieve similar performance in F1 score to the singular relation model. However, there's a precision re recall trade-off between our model and their model, too. Um, with respect to our complex model, when we compare the two of these, well, the three of them, um, we can see that we achieve higher precision and higher F1 as well, too. So getting a little bit into the error analysis, um, what we found here when we going back and looking at, at the data, considering our results is that there are many individual mentions um, that are not labeled or just missing in the data set. If we take a look at the NCBI disease data set, there's 157 composite mentions. However, the individual mentions with respect to these composite mentions are missing or not labeled within the data. So what this means for us is if, since we're training our models on the um, our complex relation models on the composite mentions and ignoring the individual mentions, 
Um, sorry, the other, other way around. Um, it could affect evaluation performance. Um, similarly, uh, we found that there's many composite mentions that are not labeled in the data set. If we look here, we can see that there's 2,318 2, unlabeled um, composite mentions in the data. And what this means is for both of our models, if we're training on the singular relation model, it tries to omit the composite mentions. Um, and then also, if we're training on our complex mention model, it tries to omit the individual mention as well, too. Um, also, the fact that they're not labeled means that we don't know um, if it's a composite mention or not, and this could affect evaluation performance, since we could potentially be training on these unlabeled composite mentions in our singular relation models. Um, so, in conclusion, we examined various dispersed approaches to representing terms and alpha classification methods for name entity normalization. So we found that averaging the representations outperformed other methods, being the first and the last representation. Um, our complex relation models outperformed the singular relation model. And we found that with the complex relation models, more is all more context is generally better, which improved evaluation performance. And that we should always perform an analysis of the data to mitigate potential issues like previously discussed in the error analysis slide. Um, so with this, our future work includes refining the actual BioBERT model and then using our previous, our previous study as a baseline and seeing if we can achieve higher evaluation performance. In addition to this, we can swap out our bio our BioBERT or a encoder for different encoder types, such as BioMegatron, which contains um, 1.2 billion parameters versus BERT 110, and then increase vocabulary size to see if we can improve evaluation performance. Um, we could also, we're also looking into mitigating the issues noted in our error analysis and then comparing this baseline to the, the then subsequent um, experiments. And then lastly, we want to look into an end to end joint learning architecture where we want to incorporate more related tasks such as entity typing and uh, name entity recognition as well, too. And with this, thank you for your time. And any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> any question from the audience? I can't see the chat since I'm sharing my screen. Uh, there. Okay, sorry. I, I see. Okay, I don't see anything. Okay. I have a question. So. Uh, Presentation, Clint. Uh, my question is: uh, so, so you, in your, when you were reporting results, you the results were single and versus complex, and you mentioned that your complex um, relation results were better, um, which intuitively doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you have something more complex and you're trying to do something simpler. Usually, machine learning models do better with the single or, or, or you know simpler things rather than more complex things. Do you have any um, intuition about uh, maybe I missed something in, in how the evaluation was done? But can you maybe uh, explain that a little, uh, elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. So your question was um, you were concerned the fact that the complex relation models perform better on average than the individual or singular mention models. And intuitively, you're saying it doesn't make sense that since we can classify something easier and a simpler, easier versus something more complex. Oh, that, that's what it sounded like, but maybe I'm missing something. No, um, our singular, sorry, our complex relation model, let me go back a bit. It does do better on, on average than the singular relation models. Um, as far as intuition behind this, I, I can't say for certain that I know exactly why. Um, That's a very good question to be honest with you. Um, maybe it's just the fact that we're just including more information that the model is able to actually generalize from. Uh, so we can have a better understanding of uh, which terms correspond to all, all of the, all not just a certain subset of the um, um, concepts that are associated with it, but all the concepts that are associated with it. So maybe it's just, a, it's just achieving a better understanding of which concepts are associated with a given term. Um, I can't say for certain, that I know exactly what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I can only speculate. I know that doesn't answer your, your question. It's a very, very good question. Well, I think it's, it's something worth uh, thinking about. Generally speaking, when we're doing machine learning, I mean, we expect things that are simpler <laughs> to be more high, higher performing. Um, so um, it was a little confusing uh, in that sense. But thank you. 
Any any other questions? Great, thank you. Oh yeah, you have a question. Great. No, no, I was just going to say that I had the same question as Halil, and I, I wonder if it has to do with the fact that that you're somehow aggregating more information, you know, because you're averaging, right? So, so um, perhaps there's more evidence, like you're accumulating evidence about a mapping when, yeah, you know, about a normalization when you have more, more complex, more information effectively to work with. Anyway, worth worth exploring. It, it's also there. The my issue, some of the issues might be part of their analysis as to where we're seeing that, um, right, if I find it here, there's some interventions that are not labeled within the data, so they might actually have an, have an effect on it as well, too. Um, but for instance, we have these composite mentions here that, that, are, that are labeled for us, but there might be individual mentions of that composite mention in the data. And there also, I found that there are some singular terms, so terms with one word, that map to um, that that are composite mentions, so they map to more than one uh, con concept. So in this instance, if we have the same word that's mapping to different concepts, you're, you're confusing the, the network. You're saying learn on this. Okay, in the next instance, it's actually something else. So this will decrease the evaluation performance for the singular re relation models, um, but not so much the, the the complex relation models. If if that makes sense. So we might be seeing something similar to this. Um, and, and my results, which hopefully we can debunk this um, later on when we do our future work. Great, thank you. Uh, so um, we're going to have around uh, less than 15 minutes break, around 12 minutes break, and we're going to continue uh, our paper session after uh, around, yeah, it's it should be 9.45 uh, Eastern, a time and 15.45 friends time. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, the next presenter to be to get prepared is Darshini. Uh, so yeah, okay, so it would be, it will be after the break. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so the next, uh, the next paper, uh, will be graph convolutional networks for chemical relation extraction and Darshini will uh, present it. Darshini, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'm Samantha Mahendra, and today I'm here to present my work on graph convolutional neural networks for chemical relation extraction. This is the outline for the presentation. Chemical patents offer exclusive rights to use specific chemicals, molecules, compounds to the scientists who obtain them. Chemical patents include information about novel chemicals and chemical reactions. Therefore, they play a vital role in the chemical and the pharmaceutical industry. Relation extraction. Relation extraction is a task of uh, NLP. This helps to identify and classify relations between two entities in a text. The figure here shows an example where different relations exist between entities in a chemical patent. Here, the reaction step, the starting material and the reaction product are the entities and there are relations between the um, entities. Let's take a look at the da data set we have utilized in this work. So we use the CLEF 2020 data to evaluate our approaches in this work. So CLEF data set includes chemical entities and events that, that, that explains the sequence of steps that lead a chemical reaction to an end product. The table shows the statistics of CLEF data set. The corpus includes 10 entity classes and two classes of trigger words, reaction step and workup. So the last two columns here that uh, shows the reaction step as uh, RS and the workup as W. And the relations are divided into two classes, ARG1 and ARGM. The ARG1 class shows the relations between a trigger word and chemical compound entities, and ARGM shows the relations between a trigger word and experimental parameters. 
the figure shows a part of the sentence from this data set and we can see how the arg1 relation forms between a trigger word and an entity let's move to the methodology in this work we used kempaton and bird as our word embeddings kempaton um, embeddings is a static word embedding trained over chemical patents BERT is a context-based representation of a token is generated based on the surrounded words in the text. And following other um, show, shows the pre-trained BERT models we explored here. Neural networks gained massive success in the last decade. However, early variants of the neural network could only be implemented using regular or Euclidean data. But many data in the real world have underlying graph structures, which are non-Euclidean. Graph neural networks is a deep learning based method that deals with the non-Euclidean graph data that contain rich relational information between elements. So graph convolutional neural network are considered to be one of the basic GNN variants. Kiff in his pioneering work presented GCN and showed uh, it achieved the state of the art classification results on several benchmark graph data sets. However, GCN hasn't been applied on relation extraction data sets before. The basic operations of GCNs are very similar to the uh, CNN. The figure shows how the, 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 the difference in how the convolution is applied in a CNN versus GCN. Our GCN based approach includes um, two GCN architectures. The first we call it a GCN vanilla. Here we propose to build one large graph over the entire corpus. The number of nodes in the graph equals the number of sentences and the number of unique words in the corpus. The figure here shows the structure of a graph we build for this approach. Nodes that begin with S are the sentence nodes and the rest are unique nodes. The black bold edges between the sentence nodes and the word nodes are the sentence word edges and the thin black edges between the word nodes are the word to word edges. We calculate the weight of the edge between two word nodes based on pointwise mutual information. A positive PMI value indicates a semantic correlation between the words in a sentence. Therefore, we consider edges between the word nodes where the PMI value is positive. And we calculate the weight of the edge between the word and the sentence based on the TF-IDF value. Then we utilize the pre-trained word embeddings to generate the initial word vectors for the word nodes. And then we average the word vectors of the word nodes connected to a sentence node to create an embedding representation for the sentence node. Finally, we model the graph with a two-layer GCN. A two-layer GCN pa passes messages from the nodes that are at maximum two steps away. In other words, the vectors um, in the word, word node gets multiplied by the PMI value of the edges between them, whereas the vectors in the sentence node gets multiplied by the TF-IDF TF value of the edges between them. And there are uh, in our graph, there are no direct sentence-to-sentence -sentence nodes. Um, therefore, uh, they are, they, but, they, but they are connected through the word node. Therefore, a two-layer um, GCN um, allows information passing from one sentence node to another. The figure here shows the, how the mechanism, um, message passing mechanism works. So this shows the sample graph of two sentence nodes and five word nodes with randomly, in, um, with uh, the word nodes, um, uh, word vectors initialized for the each node. And let's consider the sentence node S1 as our target node here. In the first layer, the sentence node S1 gets the information from its one-hop neighbors. S1 gets from the W3 and W11, and W3 gets from S1, W11, and S5, and the S5 gets from W2 and W18. In the second layer, the sentence node S1 gets information from its two-hop neighbor, its S5, through the word node W3. Finally, the output of this um, second layer node is fed, fed into a softmax layer for classification. Next, we build a model that combines GCN and BERT. We call it GCN-BERT. 
So BERT is um, BERT captures uh, the local contextual information within a sentence or document well by embedding both semantic and syntactic information in a learned representation. However, its ability to capture the long range dependency uh, global information in a text is limited. So on the other hand, um, GCN captures the global association information by performing convolution operations on neighbor nodes in a graph. To generate a better representation, capturing both local and the global information is essential. Since BERT is good at capturing the local contextual information and GCN is good at capturing the global information, we built a model that combines the capability of BERT with the GCN. Here we allow the local and the global information to interact through different layers of BERT and GCN, allowing them to influence mutually to build together a final representation for classification. Let's step through this figure. First, we extract the sentence where the entity pair is located. We use the BERT tokenizer to tokenize the sentences into words. Then we build a vocabulary um, map, mapping the unique tokens to integers. Next, we generate a vocabulary graph as shown here. The number of nodes um, equals the number of unique words in the corpus. The nodes from the input sentence S1 here is shown in the um, blue, um, whereas the, other, um, the word nodes from other sentences are shown in yellow. In the vocabulary graph, we denote the word nodes in the, um, uh, by the map integer numbers. Here also, we use pointwise mutual information to measure the weight of the edge between two word nodes. Next, we pass the graph through a two-layer GCN to generate graph embeddings based on the properties of their neighbors. GCN performs multiple levels of convolution to capture the global information between the nodes that are not connected directly. Next, we combine the mapped word indices with the generated graph embeddings before passing them into BERT. This helps to capture the order of the words in the sentence and the global association information um, um, captured by the graph. Usually, BERT architecture takes token segment and position embeddings of the input text. Here, we combine the word token embeddings um, uh, with the uh, graph embeddings. When the token embedding layer converts each word piece token into a vector representation, uh, we combine the graph embedding vector with it. Next, BERT applies the bidirectional training, which simultaneously takes the previous and the next tokens into account and represents the input sequence. Finally, the fi um, final embedding representation is fed into a fully connected layer for classification, and error is backpropagated all the way to the GCN, and um, this repeats until the loss is minimized. Next, we'll talk about the various input representation, input entity representations. A sentence can have multiple entity pairs. So therefore, we need to represent the, re re represent the targeted entity pair in a distinguishable way from the other entity pairs. So therefore, we expl explored three different variations of this input entity representations. For example, if we take the input sentence here, we, this has four different entities. So we, we consider the T14 and the T1 as our targeted entities, which we are trying to represent. So in the representation A, we input the entire sentence where the entity pair is located. Both the targeted and the non-targeted entity pairs are represented as it is. And in the representation B, uh, we remove the non-targeted entity pairs from the input sentence. And the targeted entity pairs are represented as it is. And in the representation C, uh, we replace the targeted entity pair with its semantic type in the input sentence. The non-targeted entity pairs are represented as it is. Let's move into the results. In this work, um, we use precession recall and F1 score to evaluate our approaches. So the table here shows the results of the uh, GCN vanilla approach across the three representations um, we, we just discussed. So all the input entity representations obtain um, similar precision recall and F1 score. So in the representation B, we remove the non-targeted entity pairs from the input sentence, which outperform the other um, two 
representations comparatively. So this shows that masking the non-targeted entities help to extract essential information to identify the targeted entities better. Also, we can see the, the each event class performance in this approach is proportional to the number of instances in the training set. And um, this table here um, shows the results uh, for the GCN BERT approach across the three input representation. GCN BERT uh, outperformed the GCN Vanilla approach. So the notable increase in the performance of the GCN BERT shows the advantage of combining the BERT uh, with GCN, allowing interactions between the local and the contextual information, local and the global information. Representation B and C um, comparatively obtained a higher precision recall and F1 score with the GCN BERT method. So most of the input sentences in the test set have uh, multiple entity pairs in a sentence. Therefore, we believe that masking the non-targeted entities or replacing the targeted entities by their semantic types provide a better input representation for an entity pair. And the table here shows a comparison between the two approaches and our previous approaches from our previous works. So the GCN bird outperformed all other approaches um, uh, and obtain the highest overall precision recall and F1 score on this data set, CLEF 2020. Especially it outperformed um, the both uh, GCN and BERT alone, which confirms the adv advantage of uh, combining them. When comparing the GCN BERT um, uh, CNN based approach to the GCN Vanilla approach, we can see that GCN Vanilla obtain a higher recall and F1 score, but not precision. So CNN captures the local information between the words better, whereas the GCN captures the global information better. So this shows that the global information, capturing the global information is beneficial uh, for classifying the relations in this data set. So from all the results, um, we can conclude that GCN-based approaches perform well with this chemical patent data set, CLEF 2020. Combining the GCN and BERT and allowing both types of information to interact through the layers of attention mechanism is beneficial compared to using BERT and GCN alone. So replacing the targeted entities with their semantic types or masking the non-targeted entities in a sentence effectively provides a unique representation of an input sentence. And here are some uh, directions we are interested in taking in the future for relation extraction. In traditional pipelines, um, a a NER, uh, named entity recognition, is performed initially to identify and label the entities. And RE is performed next to extract and classify relations. However, performing both um, simultaneously and utilizing the dependency between the two tasks helps to decrease the error propagation in the issue in the pipeline model. Also in the future, we, explore, um, we will explore more ways to improve the performance of our existing approach. Hybrid approaches, which include a deep neural network and rule-based model have proved to increase the performance with some data sets. Therefore, we plan on um, building uh, more hybrid models. Also, we would like to investigate more into expanding the GCN models to perform multi-class classification and benchmark uh, against different data sets. Thank you for listening. Um, any questions? Thank you very much. Any question? I, I, I just have uh, one question. Um, uh, you have used graphical structure and you embedded and you used uh, uh, with BERT to like um, to form any architecture. I'm wondering, is there any room for any other type of graphical information like uh, uh, graphical structure of, for example, UMLS concepts could be found in text? Uh, do you think there? Um, yeah, we can. Uh, yes, it, it's a good, 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 good. good. Um, good suggestion. Yes, we would like uh, we, we can incorporate more information than like so my structure just take the word embedding representation of the word that we in the graph, but we can um, also like by incorporating the UMLS, um, give, we can give more context to the word in that graph, which will help, um, um, which can help more in identifying the relation classes better. 
Um, so we, we can uh, try that one in the future too. Yeah, great. Thank you. Any any other any other question? Okay. I have a quick question. Um, actually, can you give us a <clears throat> bit more sense about the data set? So you there were two relations that you talked about. Um, reaction step and workup and just from the name of it it's not clear to what they mean uh can you elaborate on that just a little bit yes i can do that um give me one second i'm gonna pull up the slide um so uh in the data set like uh they, they have like these all are like uh, entities like we can treat in a general relation extraction data, data set, how we have all the entities and relation between them, we can look at them like that. But the only difference is like when it comes to, so this talks about the chemical patent. So it's about a chemical reaction. So when a chemical reaction is happening, what is the action that was performed between the chemicals uh, that uh, uh, led to the um, uh, reaction? So whatever that action is uh, that like, so if you say that benzyl alcohol can be transformed to benzaldehyde, so here that action that was performed was that transformed. Like that for the workup also. So the, the difference is like when there is a, um, the, um, uh, the, the reaction step with, with these uh, experiment, uh, the, the reaction properties entities, uh, when there is a relation between them, it, it was called this ARG1. And then, like the workup is also an action performed on the reaction um, or, or be, 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 be between chemical entities. And then, when it is associated with the, uh, the, the with these uh, what do you call it, experimental parameters that was given, like a time or temperature or the yield of that one. So we consider that as a arg M class. So basically, all of these are entities. It's just that uh, how they are labeled in the uh, annotated in the way. So the reaction and the workup uh, shows the action that was performed on the uh, on the chemical. Uh, that's the difference between them. But we can treat this as a normal uh, like relation extraction data set if you consider that all of a, all, all all as a relations. So, so when you say uh, relation relation extraction here, uh, do you mean identifying the arguments as well or just the um, just the um, triggers essentially right. uh, finding uh -huh. that for example transform this reaction step or are you uh, also doing the uh, relation extraction or event extraction step here uh -huh. right so it was um, uh, this this we, we, we participated in this challenge and it was like a event extraction task which actually involves both the NER where you identify these entities and annotate them and also like where you identify the trigger words so um, that that was done after that like we uh, uh, use the um, relation extraction to see whether we, which relation uh, which entities are connected or not uh, so it, it was a two-step process uh, which we participated before, but I was using uh, like we we have a system called Medesi that we use. Um, it's a call like um, uh, we, we use to identify the trigger words and the entities. So I have used well, after the identification of that entities and annotation. After that, I took it and was doing the relation extraction. So when I say relation extraction, it's already annotated entities. I'm trying to figure out which entities have relation or not. Yes, but the first part was about identifying these trigger words and the entities in the sentence. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, the next uh, presenter will be Moshkan and uh, the paper she's going uh, to present is biomedical word sense disambiguation with contextualized representation learning. Uh, hello everyone, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, yes, yes, we can. So thank you all for being here today for my presentation. So today, uh, as far as I said, uh, I'm going to talk about this paper. The title is Biomedical Words and System Education with Contextual Representation Learning, which is a joint work with my uh, supervisors, Evangelist Milius and uh, Norbert Zeh. So at the, I, first I'm going to go through an introduction and motivation for the work and then uh, what, uh, what we proposed as a new method and uh, later I will talk about the results. Uh, so let's see uh, what is the semantic text analysis. When we talk about the semantic uh, analysis uh, of the text, uh, 
like these systems uh, actually involve uh, some steps. The first one is like understanding the context of uh, the natural language, and then uh, we need to understand uh, and detect the emotions uh, on the, uh, behind the text. And also the other step is extracting valuable information from uh, an extra, uh, unstructured data. And also we know that the semantic analysis is kind of a process of drawing meaning from the text. So what we are looking for is to understand uh, like the context better uh, to get uh, the meaning uh, full representation from that. But uh, how the semantic analysis works, uh, like uh, these lexical semantics uh, between the lexical items uh, need to be identified to understand uh, and analyze uh, the semantics of the text. That uh, these uh, lexical items are including of uh, hyponyms, meronyms, polysyms, synonyms, antonyms, and uh, homonyms. But uh, based on the problem and the task in natural language processing uh, that we are going to follow, we need to understand that which one of these uh, lexical items we need to focus on uh, more to uh, get like that uh, task be solved. And when we are going to enhance the machine and the systems to have like a kind of an automated semantic analysis, we uh, need it to works with the help of like the, some of the machine learning algorithms. And for this aim, we need to train the machines to make like a, accurate predictions based on the past observation. So as much as we can uh, provide information to the machine uh, to learn better in the training time, it can uh, learn better and uh, provide us like uh, better uh, predictions for the future uh, unobserved data. Uh, and uh, like in here uh, specifically, there are some uh, various subtasks involved in a semantic based approach for machine learning, uh, which these two subtasks are including of word senses and and uh, relationship extraction for text classification. First, I will uh, go through a brief discussion uh, of word senses and question problem. Uh, as you might know that uh, when we talk about like for sense the sample question problem, we do have a text uh, and also in that text, we have some ambiguous words. And by ambiguous words, uh, we mean that uh, those words, uh, they might have multiple different meanings based on the knowledge base that we are using. And that uh, we wanted to understand which meaning is like the best match uh, based on the context. So we need to have like a fixed inventory of potential word senses. For example, let's say Wikipedia or WordNet uh, that they have uh, different multiple meanings of those words. And then we need to link uh, the word to its most current, uh, correct meaning in that knowledge base. And the way that it, uh, it's going to happen is just by considering the context of the text to learn uh, which meaning is the best match for that. And also when we talk about like the relation extraction, uh, like this task uh, consists of detecting the semantic relations in the text and the relationships usually involve two or more, uh, more than two entities from that text that uh, mostly uh, when we are talking about the name entities uh, in the text, we can consider like the names of the people, places or companies. Uh, for example, in here, I have an example that it shows how these uh, relations between these uh, named entities are, are going to work and uh, how we can uh, extract the relation type of between the, between the names. For example, if we consider like uh, Steve Jobs is, is one of the founders of Apple, which is headquartered in California, we either can consider Steve Jobs and Apple as the person and company, or on the other side, we can consider uh, Apple and California as the company place kind of relation. So this is a kind of an example of the relation extraction task. But uh, when we talk about the text classification, we wanted to uh, learn, like enhance the model uh, to assign the predefined categories to the text. Uh, and it can be defined into topic classification, sentiment analysis, and also intent classification. But uh, like, uh, if I wanted to briefly talk about some of the motivations of uh, these uh, problem that we are solving here, uh, 
is that we can consider ambiguity is inherent to human language and uh, we can say that uh, we can have multiple different meanings not just in the text but also when we are talking but as human we can understand the correct meaning um, because of like the previous and the uh, our, our upcoming words uh, after uh, that ambiguous words but but we wanted to enhance the machine to learn and react uh, kind of similar to what uh, human are doing and also uh, it's kind of like a uh, by using the Wikipedia like uh, as a good source uh, of a knowledge base, we can uh, enhance the model to understand that the meaning better. And uh, on the other side, uh, like by uh, solving this disambiguity task, maybe we can enrich the educational materials better, and uh, it could be helpful for annotating the web pages and understanding the sense of large uh, amount of the data. And so uh, in here, uh, for solving like the, the divorce and disambiguity task, specifically on biomedical uh, text, uh, we are going to use uh, a new contextualized representation learning. And uh, when uh, I talk about like a representation learning, as you all know, we wanted to try to uh, bring uh, a better representation uh, for the words and also the text uh, in terms of uh, a vector representation, that it could be like uh, into a d-dimensional uh, uh, kind of representation. But the important thing in here is that how we are going to uh, extract the important features from the text to uh, better and better uh, provide these representations to solve a different NLP task and not just the worsens this ambiguity one. Uh, but specifically, if uh, I consider the disambiguation task, so the way that uh, these are biomedical representations or embeddings would work is kind of like the same way that we can consider the traditional uh, one-hot encoding approach uh, to extract the embeddings, is that when we have like a, a sentence or a text, we can assign one to each one of the words uh, at, each, uh, at each individual level. And as zero for the other uh, words. And when we uh, pass like uh, these uh, vector representation to uh, a neural network, uh, it can uh, like assign the weights better uh, for the words based on their similarities to each other. And uh, like at the end, we can uh, find uh, what of each uh, word has been kind of like a mask word uh, based on the similarity that we have ranked uh, these uh, previous words that we assigned the vector to them. Uh, but for bringing like a better representation, uh, the problem specifically would be like uh, it's kind of uh, an area of the work that we need to understand uh, the context of the text better to bring a numerical representation for different sorts of signals that these signals uh, not just only could be text but it also could be like uh, the video image and audio uh, source of the data but the importance uh, role of the representation learning uh, would be like in the reducing of the high the high dimensionality of the data into a low dimensionality kind of representation that it is really a uh, uh, a great help uh, to ease uh, discovery of the patterns and anomalies uh, while also it could provide a better understanding of the data. And so we can have a better understanding of the future behavior when we are going to predict that. And uh, like uh, in terms of the language modeling representation, we can consider the aesthetic word embedding that it includes uh, the n-gram, unigram, bidirectional, uh, exponential, and also continuous space mod models. Uh, and uh, also these uh, language modeling representation could also be uh, including of the natural language models and also the pre-trained language models. That in this work, we are uh, focusing on the pre-trained language models that uh, as you all know, these are like the, the top models that are uh, work very well uh, in very different domains of NLP. Uh, but how we uh, ended up uh, to bringing a new representation for, so first uh, I went through uh, like uh, 
analyzing different aspects of different uh, recent language models to see what are the pros and cons of them to learn uh, how we can bring a better representation learning. So for this aim, I analyzed uh, these uh, four models that uh, are including of the BERT, LMMS, Sense, and BERT, and ours. And uh, the mutual thing between all of these uh, four models is that they are all uh, the contextual word embedding models. And I can say that uh, these are not just specifically for the biomedical text. Uh, actually, they uh, work on uh, general English text as well. Uh, but I just wanted to analyze uh, what are the pros and cons of them to uh, analyze uh, like each one of these models layer by layer to understand uh, which layer uh, is performing better and which layer has a more important role. And then on the other side, I, I also analyzed uh, them by looking at the part of the speech. And in terms of the part of the speech, I uh, categorize the data into four uh, categories of non-verbs, adverbs, and adjectives, and then I look at uh, like the behavior of these models on uh, these different uh, four types of the uh, words in the text. So based on this analysis, we came up uh, with a new representation uh, to uh, like kind of uh, improve those representation that uh, we call this representation as biosibert, that it has like three uh, main steps. The first step is context retrieval, second step is word embedding, and the last step is sense embedding. The way that it works is that we uh, kind of uh, understand which words are the ambiguous words in the text uh, and understand the text better uh, in the context retrieval step, and then uh, apply the best embedding to extract the uh, representation for the words. Uh, I mean the ambiguous words that we extracted in the previous step and not just those ambiguous words, but uh, also like the representation for the senses. And by senses, I mean different meanings uh, from the knowledge base. And in here, if you are going to consider the UMLS or let's say the Wikipedia as our knowledge base, we can consider different senses extracted from these uh, knowledge bases. So in here, I uh, show like in more details, uh, the, uh, like uh, the details of each one of those three steps that in the context retrieval for each one of the scene sets, we collect like all of the connected concepts to that scene set from the UMLS. And then uh, we uh, collect like all of uh, those uh, concepts through one set as uh, R R S. And in the second step of uh, word embedding, uh, we kind of use like the BioBert, which is the uh, the other uh, enhanced version of the birth model and the biomedical text to extract like uh, the representation for them. And then uh, give like uh, like uh, the similarities between each one of them uh, in here, uh, in the last step, which is the sense embedding. So in the sense embedding step, we kind of uh, get the representation for the ambiguous word, which we show in here as uh, R of M which is the ambiguous mention or ambiguous word, and then the representation of the senses, uh, which are like the R of SI for uh, different uh, multiple meanings of uh, th that ambiguous word of M. And then uh, I just concat concatenate these uh, representation together. The idea behind uh, like concatenating these representation is just bringing more context from uh, the knowledge base and also the context at the same time. So uh, if you look at uh, deeply into the worst sense ambiguity problem is that if we have like better understanding of the context and collect more information from the context, we can have a better understanding of the meaning. So this is the idea in here that we uh, concatenate the representation from the knowledge base and also the context at the same time that these two bring more information when we get the cosine similarity between different multiple uh, meanings for the uh, ambiguous word. So it actually enhanced the model to understand which meaning is more closer uh, based on the knowledge base and also the context at the same time. So as a result, uh, I, uh, sorry, we just uh, use uh, the mesh data set, which is like the famous data set uh, in words and assembly and a brief uh, description of mesh, mesh data set is that it includes uh, like a uh, uh, collect, collection of the disambiguous, uh, sorry, 
combination of ambiguous words. Uh, and the point is that we wanted to apply like, different models on this data set to understand uh, which meaning is better based on uh, like the UMLS knowledge base. And uh, for uh, comparing the result of the model, uh, we uh, applied the comparison between our model with BioBirth, BioGraph, uh, deep biodiversity and deep uh, biodiversity when it's kind of a random embedding uh, versus it is a pre-trained embedding. And in here we see like uh, our results in terms of the macro accuracy and micro accuracy. Uh, when we uh, compared our results uh, with different uh, model uh, in terms of the supervised and also unsupervised uh, methods. Uh, that we can see we uh, kind of can improve uh, the result of a uh, sense disambiguity test uh, by using these uh, new uh, embedding approach. Yep, and this is the result that we have uh, so far. And uh, for the future we work, we uh, just aim to uh, understand uh, or dig into the other uh, kind of the knowledge bases, not just the UMLS, but uh, just uh, bases in the biomedical domain, and also at the same time, the other uh, data sets in the biomedical domain that we can use uh, to uh, compare the results in uh, this sample. Uh, yep, this was uh, my presentation. Thank you. I would be happy to take any question. Great, okay, thank you. Any question? Uh, thank you because uh, we uh, we uh, already out of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, Halil, uh, could you introduce our second keynote speaker? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our second, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, Olivia Bodenreiter. Is a senior scientist and acting director of the Lister Hill National Center for Biomedical Com Communications at the U.S. National Library of Medicine. Uh, Olivia's research focuses on terminology and ontology in the biomedical domain, both from a theoretical perspective um, and in their application to natural language processing, knowledge discovery, and information integration. Uh, Olivier is a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics. He received a, a MD degree from the University of Strasbourg, France in 1990, and a PhD in medical informatics from the University of Nancy, France in 1993. Before joining NLM uh, in 1996, he was assistant professor for biostatistics and medical informatics at the University of Nancy Medical School. Um, and uh, I also want to add that he was my boss uh, from 2012 to 2019 at the National Library of Medicine. Uh, welcome, Olivia. Great having you with us. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Hilo, for your kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me this morning. And yeah, I think the most relevant piece of information that you gave is that uh, you and I have been colleagues uh, for a long time. And uh, actually, some of what I'm going to present this morning is your work uh, more than it is mine. And, uh, and you've made it. Uh, May I interrupt for a second? I mean, I can hear you, but not that great. Uh, is, there, is there a way of improving the sounds, maybe? On you. Yeah, I wish we had this subject earlier. Um, just give me a second. Is this any better? Yes, much better, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, um, okay, okay, okay. So let's, uh, let's, get start, let's get started then. Uh, 
And you can see the slides, okay. Good. So, so what we're gonna talk about this morning is uh, essentially uh, trying to see how semantics can be uh, useful in, uh, uh, in literature analysis, especially from the perspective of uh, bioontologies, because that's uh, an area I've worked on for a long time. And I can tell you that I was <laughs> extremely interested in what Karen had to say this morning. And uh, I was afraid she would actually you know, her conclusion would be that, yeah, you know, don't bother with semantics, don't bother with uh, with uh, ontologies. Uh, you know, we can learn uh, from the data, and uh, and we don't need to pay attention to that anymore. So, I'm I'm glad her conclusion was much more nuanced because it would have derailed my talk uh, quite a bit. But we're gonna come back to this. Uh, towards the end, nonetheless. So I have a mandatory disclaimer, which is to say that uh, um, I'm not, uh, when I speak, I don't speak for the US government, but I just speak for myself, which is pretty much self-evident, but uh, it's, it is good to say it nonetheless. Olivia, I apologize. Um, actually, the presentation that we're seeing is the presenter view. Okay, okay, okay. So there's something that's unusual with my camera setting, uh, and it's not using the camera that I was expecting it to use. So for some reason, uh, I tested before, and it worked before except that for some reason here, it doesn't seem to recognize the, the good camera that I have. So it turns out that I have two screens, which I'm not used to having. So let me do one thing and, uh, and change the display to, I guess, Oh, that's the other one. That's the other one. Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna get there. Okay, so. Is this any better now? That's perfect. Okay, okay, sorry about this. Of course, we train for this. We set up good environments and uh, and there's often glitches uh, nonetheless. So my apologies for this. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna do uh, this this morning. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my institution, the Liste Hill National Center for Biomedical Communications, where a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about have been developed. We're gonna see that bioontologies can provide a source of semantic information. Uh, one particular resource that we're gonna talk about is the Unified Medical Language System. It's been mentioned many times this morning already. But we're going to look, I'm going to take, I'm going to give you my perspective on it. And we're going to look at it from the perspective of semantic interoperability. And then uh, we're going to briefly review the role of uh, bioontologies in um, biomedical text processing. So starting with the Listel National Center for Biomedical Communications. So, it's part of the National Library of Medicine, which is uh, the largest library uh, in the world. Uh, it's also part of the National Institutes of Health. And of course, you all know some of the flagship products of NLM, including PubMed MedLife, clinicaltrials.gov, and the Unified Medical Language System. So, Although we are library, we don't just uh, 
do books. We also do data, including the biomedical literature, <clears throat> uh, gene sequences. Uh, we provide information for the lay public. And as you can see to the right, uh, the title of our strategic plan is actually a platform for biomedical discovery and data power, data powered health, which means that it's way beyond, you know, just providing books. So in addition to the library operations, uh, there's also a research component because we're part of the uh, intramural research program of the NIH. And there's two aspects to this, computational biology and computational health. And of course, there's also an extramural uh, component to NLM. Many of you might uh, be familiar with it because that's where grants are provided to um, academic um, uh, institutions. So the list here, Center is a component as of NLM. <clears throat> the, the other uh, research and development center besides List Hill is uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which you also may be familiar with. Initially, uh, the List Hill focused on biomedical communications, hence its name, but it's been reorganized lately and it now focuses on health informatics more generally, including clinical data science, um, making data interoperable, uh, developing scalable methods for clinical text and images for processing them, and also more generally the translation of uh, uh, insights from research into operations. So some of the list of activities, the, the, some of our legacy activities uh, are extremely relevant to the talk this morning because they're, they're, we've done, uh, we have had activities around natural language processing, in particular, um, concept extraction and relation extraction from uh, clinical text and the biomedical literature. Uh, Dina demner fushman has a program specifically on clinical question answering. We have activities uh, on image processing and on health data powered discovery, but uh, very relevant to uh, our conversation this morning are our activities on terminology standards, including the UMLS, SNOMAD, MASH, RxNorm, LOINC, and, and many others. So I will come back to this because that's key to these are key resources uh, for powering uh, literature analysis. So let's turn now to how biointelligence uh, provide semantics. So we can start by defining biointelligies. I'm not obsessed about, you know, putting biointelligies in a specific box. Uh, I'm not obsessed about, you know, the, the philosophical definitions of ontology versus the computer science definitions of ontology. So this is one that we created uh, 15 years ago. Uh, this is the definition that we gave. And importantly in this definition uh, are two aspects of ontologies. Uh, one having to do with, you know, providing a model for the things in a particular domain, in this case, uh, the biomedical domain. And uh, very importantly, the relations, capturing the relations among these things. So that that's, that's a key element to biontologies. This relational aspect is key to biontologies, and that's really what distinguishes uh, ontologies from mere dictionaries, if you wish. But uh, as we know, words are important. We cannot just discard words, and that's the reason why many ontologies have terminological features. They have the, they provide the vocabulary. The vocabulary 
uh, the language uh, to a community to talk about uh, their domain. But also um, by providing a specific ontological representation, in addition to providing a common vocabulary, uh, it, supports, it supports standardizing the domain and also uh, facilitating the analysis of the data in the domain. So there's a continuum between terminologies and ontologies. And again, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna use termina. I'm gonna use ontologies pretty liberally this morning, because at the end of the day, we need both aspects anyway. So um, let's look at how semantics or what kind of uh, semantic features are. Uh, made available through bioontologies. So the first level, and again, it's been alluded to this morning um, many times. The first, the first level is uh, to recognize uh, which which words or which terms are actually synonymous, and making sure that synonymous words uh, or terms are related together such that they can be recognized and used as synonyms by an NLP system. And uh, that's the example, for example, here where we have uh, uh, malignant tumor of pancreas and pancreatic cancer that just mean the same thing, but it's, it's important to recognize that and to, to be able to leverage this. There's a second element, which is that of concept categorization. Of course, it's really important to know that pancreatic cancer is a type of disorder and not a protein, for example. Um, then there's the vast domain of the relations among concepts. And it can be subdivided into two uh, large groups. One is the hierarchical relations, mostly subclass relations or uh, ESA relations. And these are really important because they, they will support the traversal of fine-grained concepts to their uh, broader ancestors, if you wish. And they provide, in fact, a form of concept categorization. It's useful to have direct categorization because you don't have to do the climbing of the hierarchical relations, but, uh, but it's also good to be able to do, uh, to, to, to navigate those hierarchical relations in a finer grained fashion. The other type of relations are associative relations, which you can think of as transversal relations. So non-hierarchical relations, and there's a, uh, a vast uh, uh, array of these relations. An example here would be that uh, pancreas is the location of pancreatic cancer. So it's basic information. Everybody knows this, except that a system uh, wouldn't have this basic knowledge and wouldn't necessarily be able to relate pancreas to pancreatic cancer. And the last aspect is that of, you know, a high level conceptualization of the domain. And, and again, it's been alluded to this morning many times, but, uh, but it's important to be, to encode, for example, that at the very high level, drugs generally treat diseases such that when in the context of a sentence or of a paragraph, we have uh, uh, drugs, uh, we have diseases, and we have some kind of an indication that a connection between the two could correspond to a treat connection. Now we can extract the relation uh, with a reasonable degree of certainty. So we're going to look. Uh, we're going to uh, look at three examples of bioontologies, and I took them as different as possible. First one is MASH, medical subject headings. It's been mentioned this morning. It's it was developed by the National Library of Medicine, and it's, of course, used for 
indexing and retrieval of the biomedical literature. The second one is the gene ontology. And the gene ontology is used uh, you know, for annotating gene products mostly in model, um, uh, model organism databases. And that's what it was developed for in the first place. And it was developed by the Gene Ontology Consortium um, starting almost 20 years ago. But interestingly, it's increasingly used you know, for reasoning with bio biological information these days. And the last one I'm gonna uh, take an example of is uh, a uh, clinical ontology. And uh, I'm gonna pick SNOMED CT here, developed by uh, SNOMED International, which is Standard Development Organization. And it's used for the coding and exchange of clinical information, but also increasingly for clinical analytics. So I picked these three because <clears throat> even when the focus is on the analysis of the biomedical literature, as was mentioned this morning, it's really important to be able to bring the literature in the context of broader biology or uh, information from electronic health records. And that's where we may need to integrate, you know, the literature with uh, assertions coded to the, annotated to the gene ontology uh, found in, um, in model organism databases or, um, or link the literature to electronic health record information uh, coded with SNOMED, for example. So that's why I took these three examples. So let's start with MESH, you're familiar with it. Uh, MESH contains words, of course. And uh, interestingly, in MESH, in a MESH descriptor, uh, there's already an organization of the terms into, um, into group, there's grouping of the terms and not of the terms in the mesh descriptor are actually synonymous. Uh, all, not all the terms are synonymous with each other. There's groupings and the, the relations among these groupings is specified. So for example, we're looking at Alzheimer's disease here and um, um, there's a, a bunch of uh, synonyms for Alzheimer's disease, uh, including uh, senile dementia, but, or Alzheimer's syndrome, but uh, you can see also that uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease towards the bottom um, is, is a uh, narrower form of uh, Alzheimer's disease and it's recognized by MESH as being, you know, in the same ballpark, but not quite synonymous. So what we will see is that there are many different ways of encoding synonymy and uh, the treatment of synonymy in um, biomedical terminologies is, uh, uh, is interesting. So there's words, but there's more than words. There's also a bunch of relations in MESH. For example, Alzheimer's disease is in the nervous system uh, diseases hierarchy. Uh, under dementia on the one hand and under uh, neurodegenerative diseases on the other, but it's also part of the mental disorders in a different tree of MESH. So when we navigate these relations, we need to be conscious that uh, the same concept might actually have uh, multiple types of hierarchical uh, relations. So looking at the gene ontology, and now we find uh, words exactly in the same way uh, that we find in MESH. And interestingly, they also collect synonyms and they also treat the synonyms pretty much in the same way uh, MESH does. So not all the synonyms are <laughs> exact synonyms and, um, and some are you know, narrow, narrower than um, the main term which begs the question, uh, a narrower term 
is this actually a subclass or is it, uh, is it truly a synonym? And why treating one, uh, one way uh, rather than the other? Uh, I'm not gonna answer this question, but uh, we, need to be, we need to be careful when we take you know, a bag of synonyms somewhere, uh, we need to be conscious that uh, you know, depending on how this ontology was put together, the synonyms may not be truly um, may not be true synonyms. So, of course, this, the gene ontology contains much more than words. It contains a lot of relations of various types. Hierarchical. That's the ESA relations that I mentioned already uh, in, uh, in with the black arrows there but also other types of associative relations in the various colors. In the interest of uh, time, I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time on this. Very interestingly, in the gene ontology, we can also leverage the annotations themselves as a form of uh, relation. For example, uh, uh, to the right, we see that two, um, two proteins denoted with their uniprot identifier uh, are involved in the positive regulation of sporulation, uh, which is this particular uh, gene ontology term that uh, we're looking at in this particular case here. So, uh, so that's what Karen alluded to as the instance level. So I, I would dispute the term instance level from an ontological perspective, essentially from a philosophical ontological perspective, but that's not the point uh, this morning. Looking at SNOMED CT now, SNOMED has the words and we can see some uh, SNOMED synonyms for uh, pancreatic cancer. But SNOMED has much more than the words also. And what I'm, I'm not gonna insist, but the, the important part here is that the knowledge in SNOMED is formalized using description logics. Uh, what we see here is that malignant tumor of pancreas uh, is uh, a kind of neoplasm of pancreas, is a kind of malignant tum tumor of digestive organ, malignant retroperitoneal tumor, and malignant neoplasm of intraabdominal organ. There's a lot of knowledge there. The interesting part is that this knowledge is actually derived, this hierarchical knowledge is derived from uh, the definition itself, which is that the finding site of uh, pancreatic cancer is the pancreas, and the morphology, which in, in terms of um, uh, pathologic anatomy, is, uh, is you know, uh, a malignant neoplasm. So this formalization is important not so much for uh, extracting semantics, but it's extremely important for maintaining and ensuring the quality of bioontologies. And, and the good thing is that with these carefully crafted definitions, a lot of the maintenance of SNOMED is done automatically by a reasoner or a classifier, a description logic classifier, rather than maintained by hand. And, and of course, that's really important when you have an ontology with nearly 400,000 uh, concepts like this. Okay, so let's look at how the YMLS can be helpful in terms, contributes to semantic interoperability now. There's many of these biomedical ontologies. Uh, Karen this morning alluded to the, the richness of our domain, which is great, but it also creates uh, it also creates difficulties because each bioontology pretty much has been created for a specific purpose and it's been de developed independently from the others. And at some point we need to be able to 
you know, uh, use them together if you want to get the most out of them. So going back to the various types of uh, relations that we can find and how they contribute to semantic interoperability, uh, we talked about synonymy. So uh, strictly speaking, synonymy is an equivalence between the terms, for example, between myo myocardial infarction and heart attack. Uh, we also have mapping relations, which is essentially finding the closest term uh, from the source term in the target terminology. Lipitor is the brand name for a uh, substance called atorvastatin. So it's important if we want to know, if we want to, to uh, link them together, it's important to know that for some processing, Lipitor and atorvastatin are actually equivalent, although they are two distinct concepts. It's also important to be able to uh, move up the hierarchy, um, you know, for example, going from pancreatic cancer to pancreatic neoplasm. And that's important, for example, um, in, uh, in, in the discourse to do uh, co-reference resolution because, because the text might start talking about pancreatic cancer and then refer to pancreatic cancer as pancreatic neoplasm later the day, later uh, down the road. And so if, if we don't know that uh, one is actually an ancestor of the other, uh, we might not be able to make the connection between several sentences, which is uh, a, a lost opportunity for making connections. And of course, uh, uh, there are cases where one term in one terminology is a, needs to be expressed by multiple terms in another terminology. For example, diabetic nephropathy is uh, a nephropathy that is caused by diabetes mellitus. And knowing this association formally may help us also make uh, important connections. So the UMS metathesaurus, I'm going to go quickly uh, about the Unified Medical Language System because most of you are familiar with it. Uh, integrates 158 families of source vocabularies, uh, contains terms in 25 languages that there's not, uh, every term is not translated in 25 languages, but there are terms uh, from translations that cover 25 languages, uh, contains 12.8 million names uh, grouped into 4.5 million concepts, and there are also millions of relations, as I mentioned. And it's one important aspect is that uh, all the terminologies or ontologies are presented uh, in with a similar presentation. Uh, because if you want to use SNOMED and MESH together, well, uh, without the MLS, you would need to download SNOMED, download MESH, and deal with the specific structure of each language. The way I like to define the MLS Metathesaurus is really as a uh, terminology integration system. So we have a lot of uh, domains, for example, clinical repositories, and each domain is pretty much uh, coded, annotated uh, with a specific terminology. Let's say that SNOMED is the, the preferred terminology for coding clinical uh, repositories. Of course, uh, MESH is used for indexing the biomedical literature. OMIM is used in many uh, genetic knowledge bases. We mentioned the gene ontology for making genome annotations. Uh, the foundational model of anatomy uh, provides information about anatomy. The NCBI ta taxonomy is used to encode model organisms, etc., etc., etc. So, if we want to relate the concepts in these various terminologies point to point, that's an impossible task. Um, and I mean, some of it is done, but it's really costly and difficult to maintain. So the integration through a reference such as the UMLS makes 
uh, a great deal of sense here. So take, for example, the essence disease in MESH, and we have a distance disease also in SNOMED that we can find. So the, the MESH term we find as an index term in, um, in a midline citation, for example, and uh, the SNOMED term we find in an um, electronic health record for a patient. And when we want to link them together, for example, for the purpose of finding uh, literature information about a distance disease, uh, to treat the patient, well, it's really convenient that the OMLS has already recognized them as synonymous, uh, integrated them into the same concept, and now that provides a bridge, if you wish, between uh, the information that we can find in clinical repositories and the information that we want to find in the biomedical literature or the other way around, depending on what your particular application is. So to me, that's really the fundamental role that the UMLS metathesaurus plays here. And when we revisit the role of UMLS in terms of semantic interoperability, well, um, UMLS uh, provides synonymy information because synonymous terms are clustered into the same UMLS concept. They have the same GUI. That's how we know that they are synonymous. They are mapping, explicit mapping relations in the UMLS. Uh, they are uh, hierarchical relations that can be navigated. And uh, most often, like uh, extracted from SNOMED CT, for example, there's post coordination information um, telling us when uh, a given term can be expressed with uh, the conjunction of several other terms. So moving on and looking now at the role of bioontologies in biomedical text processing. So this is a vast uh, domain and there's been a lot of work. So I'm gonna cheat and I'm, I'm gonna look at this through the specific prism of some flagship NLM resources. So I, I'm, I'm I'm not going to talk about a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, work that's been done outside NLM. So um, NLM has worked, you know, in in the wake of the OMLS project. NLM has worked on trying to show how the OMLS could be helpful for um, for text processing and. Metamap was developed by uh, Len Aronson's group uh, for name entity recognition and uh, entity linking. Uh, Tom Reinflesch and Halil, when he was working with Tom at NLM, worked on relation extraction, uh, created the SEMREP system to do relation extraction. Of course, these two resources leverage the UMS Metathesaurus as a source of uh, vocabulary for extracting concepts from text, but also leverage the UMS semantic network. I'm going to say a little, uh, a little bit about the semantic network later on. Um, and they use the semantic network as scaffolding for extracting relations. And uh, of course, there, there's these resources that can be used for what they are, but uh, they can, they've, they've been used to, they've been applied to some data sets. And for example, SEMNETDB results from applying SEMREP uh, systematically to Medline titles and abstracts. And, and it's a, a vast collection of predications, uh, subject, predicate, object, referenced, anchored in the UMLS, and uh, that, can be, uh, that can be used as a resource in and of itself. And um, we know that it's been used, it, it is used, for example, by the NCATS translator as a source of uh, knowledge in the NCATS translator because it already processes uh, the literature and extracts uh, facts, if you wish, from the literature. 
So this is an example that um, I used a long time ago, but uh, it's still a good illustration of uh, uh, what needs to be done. So this is a short piece of text about neurofibromatosis type two. Uh, what we want to do first is entity recognition and uh, normalization. So this is what Metamap would extract. Uh, and of course, link to UMLS concepts. And, uh, and once it's linked to a UMLS concept, you can access uh, additional information, not only synonyms, but also uh, those relations that we've talked about. And in order to do this, uh, may, mostly what you, know, what you need is lexical and terminological uh, information from the UMLS metathesaurus. The next step is relation extraction. So we start from the pre annotated uh, text, if you wish, the text that be, that's been metamapped in which the concepts are already known. And then the next uh, challenge is to extract relations. This is just an, uh, a few examples of the relations that uh, could be extracted from uh, this particular piece of text. And as we know, what's required for relation extraction is really the ontological component of uh, the UMLS much more than the, uh, the, the lexical aspect. So I said that I would talk a little bit about the UMLS semantic network. What I've talked about was mostly the metathesaurus, the, the larger part of uh, the UMLS. The semantic network is a smaller component with 127 semantic type. Remember, I talked about 4.5 million concepts. So it's a, a few orders of magnitude uh, lower. And these semantic ties provide categorization. Uh, they provide two things. They provide categorization for the concepts. But they also encode knowledge by way of uh, explicit relations and named relations among the semantic types. For example, an, an anatomical structure is part of an organism. Um, uh, injury of, or poisoning disrupts psychological function. These kind of things are all encoded in the uh, semantic network and can be leveraged for text analysis. So one example is, let's imagine that in a particular sentence or paragraph, uh, you extract two concepts, you extract adrenal cortex and adrenal cortical hyperfunction that you've been able to, uh, to link to the appropriate UMLS concepts. So once we've done this, uh, we can turn to the semantic network and see that adrenal, adrenal cortex is uh, categorized by body part organ organ component, which is a type of fully formed anatomical structure. On the other hand, um, adrenal cortical hyperfunction is categorized as disease syndrome, which is a pathologic function, which is a kind of biologic function. And the semantic network tells us that the fully formed anatomical structure is the location of biologic function. So what it means is that a fully formed um, anatomical structure can be the location of a biologic function. It can be inherited down, and so a body part organ organ component can be the, lo the location of a disease syndrome, which means that if we're looking for a potential relation between adrenal cortex and adrenal cortical hyperfunction, we can hypothesize that location of might be this relation, especially if there's cues in the text to suggest that uh, uh, there's a connection um, in form of a proposition or something like this that indicates the location between these two concepts. So that's, um, <laughs> uh, don't look at me uh, a little bit, that's very much how SEMRAP works. And that's what I understand of um, how SEMRAP works very much. So in summary for all this, I, I hope I've convinced you that 
there was actually a semantic continuum between lexical resources, uh, such as the UMLS specialist lexicon. I haven't talked about it, but it's essentially uh, at, uh, at one end of the semantic continuum where there's pretty much no semantics there, uh, all the way to the ontological resources where we have uh, a lot of these uh, relations that are explicitly uh, ex explicitly represented and th that are useful for relation extraction. That's pretty much what the semantic network is about. And in between the two, there's these terminological resources that are collections of lexical items and their identifiers. Use useful for uh, entity resolution, but uh, in the OMNS, there's also a lot of relations that can be exploited for, um, you know, as semantic information for text processing. So, so keep in mind the semantic continuum among all the, the resources. So before we wrap up, uh, I actually had the same question uh, Karen uh, asked in her presentation. So uh, I formulated it slightly differently, but uh, do we, are bioontology still relevant when uh, semantics could, you know, could be learned from the data using uh, neural networks? And I think through the presentations that we've seen this morning and through Karen's own answer, uh, the answer is yes, and we can actually, uh, we don't need to restart from scratch. It would be a shame to restart from scratch, and we need to find a way of, uh, you know, leveraging the semantics that's already made explicit through these bioontologies uh, into the neural networks that, that we use for text processing. But I think, interestingly, we can also turn the question around. And can we use neural networks to build better bioontologies? And here again, there's increasing evidence that this is true. And I'm going to do um, a, a little bit of shameless promotion because we have actually a presentation later on by uh, later later this week, uh, it's on Friday at the World Wide Web Conference by my postdoc uh, Vin Nguyen, and um, and so what we're doing here is that we're actually using deep learning to learn uh, synonymy to predict synonymy among terms in the UMLS. And we started uh, about two years ago doing this. So the first models that we built were purely lexical models. And what we're presenting this year at the, the uh, World Wide Web Conference is actually a method where, in addition to the lexical features of terms, we also exploit three elements of semantic information that we can find that we can associate with uh, with the terms so we leverage the semantic types we leverage uh, the synonymy information not provided by the OMS because that's what we're trying to build so that would be cheating but uh, there's still a lot of synonymy information provided by the source terminologies as I as I showed there's synonymy in SNOMED there's synonymy in MESH so we're still entitled to use this and the last piece that we're using are the hierarchical relations uh, also coming from these source terminologies so we're we're integrating this in, in the work that we presented. We have integrated this as uh, uh, knowledge graph embeddings to complement uh, uh, the word embeddings. But there are many other ways, uh, some of which have been discussed this morning also, like uh, uh, graph approaches. And, and we're, we're looking at this. We're also, of course, we're, we're also looking at um, transformer approaches. 
and uh, and in the transformer approaches that's future work that uh, in the transformer approaches that we've created we're planning to also integrate uh, contextual information uh, which is essentially the semantic information that uh, i just talked about so i think the future is bright uh, the ontologies are here to stay uh, i don't have to find another job uh, after having done you know, ontologies for the past uh, 25 years of my life, I hope. And uh, with that, I would thank you and um, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Olivier, for that great talk. Um, and I'm glad that you're in the neural network world, world as well now. Uh, you joined us here. Um, any questions from the audience for Olivier? Um, I have uh, one question. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I think um, um, biomedical, I agree with you that biomedical ontologies are alive and uh, kind of uh, widely used. Actually, it's maybe in other domains, it's not like that. Uh, and natural language processing and this uh, pre-trained models started to like dominant but in biomedical domain i uh, um, uh, this ontology is actually this uh, knowledge sources are still a very very important source of knowledge uh, so uh, my question is that uh, in like general domain um, text processing and natural language processing we have like data sets that uh, are uh, formed for um, like uh, for knowledge sources like freebase, very general knowledge sources, not domain specific one. For example, we have uh, like uh, data sets, benchmarks for question, factoid question answering over freebase. And, you know, these uh, data sets kind of encourage uh, creating new methods, new like uh, <clears throat> customized methods for uh, working with this knowledge graphs or general purpose. Uh, do you think is there like any room for that kind of um, bench, creating benchmarks over biomedical database for but different tasks like uh, question answering or factoid, factoid questions, something like that? No. Oh. I think these data sets, these curated data sets are really important. And uh, in general, the competitive evaluations, uh, and there are many of them already in the biomedical domain, but uh, the, the competitive evaluations have been extremely useful community uh, tools, if you wish, and mechanisms for, uh, for comparing resources and for advancing uh, resources. So yes, I, I think it's important. Of course, there's a cost to doing these kind of things. Everybody loves to uh, use them and nobody wants to pay for them. And um, that's, that's sometimes uh, difficult, but uh, I think that's also the power of the community that, uh, you know, by working together, we can help develop some of these resources and use them uh use them together so um, uh, i don't know if i completely answer your question but uh but yeah, that's about you. what i could say i would also like to add to that that there are already some benchmarks like you know, bio ask uh, for question answering and semantic indexing so is it for um, a specific like uh, knowledge like umls or a specific ontology well obviously you could use those as resources for those tasks but yeah not everybody does um and and, and tasks that specifically address maybe extending these resources they don't exist but um yeah i think there are some that could be useful so to know. um and 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 i would also like that that nln can certainly take the lead in these kind of efforts i think and they have for, for a very long time but um i think it's a great place for um pushing um in this direction Lucy has a question. Lucy, do you want to go ahead and ask? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Olivier, for the talk. Um, I was just curious. So um, I, I think the UMLS Metathesaurus is like a super useful resource, um, especially since it maps so many terminologies together. But one of the things, um, I think the policy of the Metathesaurus is to not do, uh, it's to, it's to kind of take the source ontologies faithfully as they're created and then map them to each other. Um, and sometimes these source ontologies uh, they can stop being maintained or they're kind of like, um, maybe, yeah, just like, uh, no longer, um, the most accurate representation of the world. Um, so I guess like, what are your thoughts around how the UMLS Metathesaurus would adapt to these ty types of changes? And then is there room for like automated methods to maybe help, um, keep that? structured knowledge up to date? Uh, so the UMLS and the Metathesaurus in particular is many things to many people. And, and that's part of the issue. So uh, mm -hmm. when I give a talk about the UMLS, I didn't, I didn't get that today, but uh, I usually get two types of comments, usually one next to each other uh, in the questions. One is, you know, the UMLS is pretty much useless because it's, uh, you know, too high level. I need more granularity for my work because I work on this and all that. Or, and, and the next question or comment is, oh, the UMLS is too detailed. I don't need all this uh, depth, if you wish. And I would, I would prefer something that's at, some, at the much higher level. I think, uh, so you didn't ask this question, you said, what about obsolete sources? And uh, I agree that uh, there's a lot of sources that have been uh, added to the UMLS early on, if you wish, and that haven't been maintained and they can be questioned as to, uh, you know, what validity they, they bring at this point. I think, um, and somebody else might find them useful. So I think what's great about the UMLS is that uh, it lets you take what you want out of it. Of course, um, the bad thing here is that uh, there's no one size fits all and uh, you cannot just grab it and run with it or you can do this, but if you do, you may not get exactly uh, what you need out of it. And I would say that's the same issue with synonymy. So what synonymy for some, uh, what synonymy means to some, uh, it means something else to other people. Um, you know, for some applications, I, I took the example of atorvastatin and Lipitor, which is uh, atorvastatin is the ingredient in, in Lipitor. Uh, you know, for some analyses, you want to see them the same for others. You want to see them separate because maybe brand names are, are important and, uh, and there are differences between the, 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 the brands and the generic drugs, these kind of things. So uh, I think that the hard thing with the MLS is when you download the MLS, it's just the beginning of a process. And uh, you need to tailor the MLS to the point that it's going to be helpful for your specific purpose. And if you don't do this, that's fine, but you may not get exactly what you need out of it. And, uh, and again, in order to, to get better results, you may want to, to tailor it uh, in, in, in ways that uh, sometimes are fairly involved. So another example that I can take is, uh, so the first time I looked at the, well, not the first time, but uh, when I started looking deeply into the UMLS Metathesaurus uh, 25 years ago or so maybe, uh, I was shocked to discover that the graph of hierarchical relations was not acyclic. It may, you know, it made intuitive sense to me that if you integrate a bunch of uh, trees together or a bunch of acyclic graphs together, the resulting graph should be acyclic. 
And in fact, it is not. And there's many reasons about this. I wrote a paper about it uh, a long time ago. And, uh, and for some applications, it's really important that uh, you, you have an ASIC graph to traverse um, for you know, uh, consistent traverse, all these kind of things. And so in, in my work with the UMLS Metatezoras in support of automatic indexing, for the past 20 years, I've created a, an acyclic version of the uh, hierarchical relations in the UMLS. I've developed methods to, to, to do this. It's not fun, but it's just something that uh, someone needs to do for a specific application. And that's not part of the UMLS itself because the UMLS essentially provides in a, you know, in, in the same way that libraries provide books to their patrons uh, without necessarily telling you which book you should read and hopefully without removing from the shelves the books that uh, they judge in a, or that others might judge inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so in the same way, pretty much in the same spirit, the uh, UMLS Metathesaurus gives you the world as it appears in these bioontologies, in, in all their beauty, but also uh, messiness in some cases. And it leaves as an exercise to the reader, uh, you know, to, to tailor this for a specific application. Yeah, thank Long you. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> And that's so that that kind of um, reminds me of the some of the efforts that we were undertaking at NLM to have a NLP review of of the MLS. That that would be more useful um, um, for, for for this processing text. And Dina's group sort of came up with a version, but I'm not sure that it's been used. Yeah, there, there have been attempts, and so just going to the obsolete stuff. The obsolete, um, the obsolete sources are marked, and you can actually get a version of the UMLS that doesn't that that uh, doesn't contain the obsolete uh, content. And th there's been discussions about further curating the UMLS and kicking out some of these sources that uh, you know that haven't been maintained in a long time and that are now questionable in terms of their quality. So that, that stay tuned and uh, we might see that actually in the next few editions of, uh, of the UMLS. Any other questions? All right, we are already 10 minutes past. Um, so let's thank Olivier again uh, for that great talk. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining. So the next session will be in 50 minutes. Um, it's, it'll be, um, let's see, 12.50 Eastern time. Um, and we'll have the panel, which uh, Lucy will lead. So until then, um, see you later. <laughs> at Columbia University. Um, <clears throat> I got my training in computer science and I also got my uh, PhD in biomedical and health informatics from the uh, University of Washington. Um, and then uh, my, I started as a, a ontology knowledge representation researcher. So my early work was in knowledge representation for clinical trial protocols and then later clin uh, cancer clinical trial common data elements after I came to Columbia as a faculty member, I uh, realized the importance of, you know, discovering knowledge from data and then applying this knowledge uh, representation uh, to the data to provide decision support. Uh, that's how I started to looking at the, uh, the interaction uh, between data and knowledge representation, how knowledge representation should um, be informed by the need to support interoperability between representation and uh, decision support. Um, so I started, uh, particularly I look at the representation for clinical
trial uh, uh, recruitment, uh, because you know uh, all the clinical trial research recruitment is followed by the eligibility criteria. So I did uh, some work in eligi uh, uh, clinical trial eligibility criteria representation and use that to facilitate the natural language processing and uh, relate downstream um, uh, like population representativeness, quantification, and so on. Um, maybe I, I will stop here and then for the interest of time. And I really, I'm really excited to join this panel to uh, discuss with you all. <clears throat> Thank you, Chunghua. Um, Melissa, we, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm also very honored and grateful to be here today with you all. It's, it's really a pleasure. Um, definitely topics that um, I'm very, very invested in. Um, I am the Chief Research Informatics Officer at the University of Colorado Anschutz. Um, I'm also the uh, Marsico Chair uh, in Data Science, which is a, a new chair position, so it's also an honor to have that position. Um, my background is actually in molecular genetics and developmental biology, um, but I became an informatician when I started working at the zebrafish database, where I designed methodologies to encode zebrafish uh, phenotypic data in the same way that we describe patients um, and helped uh, put model organism data into, um, into, the, into clinical diagnostic applications. Um, and since that time, I have, I've really spent my the last so dozen or so years working on knowledge engineering around um, the building of uh, uniting ontologies, as well as knowledge graphs for mechanism discovery, and really trying to uh, cro cross the chasm of semantic despair, as uh, coined by Chris Shute, uh, which is really like, how do we take... Um, basic research data and make it interoperable with the clinical data so we can support precision medicine, rare disease diagnostics, um, and all the kinds of um, use of these uh, data that are not really thought about as being you know, particularly relevant or interoperable with our clinical environs. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, I, I, I'm also very invested in open science and team science and recently have led the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, which is a um, community um, project to unite uh, the nation's electronic health record data uh, now with uh, 72 institutions um, harmonizing their electronic health record data. Uh, so that's a sort of curation and um, data harmonization at a sort of, you know, scale that's rather unprecedented in the clinical informatics community. And so that, that's where the, the team science and the sort of what I like to refer to as socio-technical engineering <laughs> um, comes into play and uh, really a testament to the informatics community uh, volunteerism. Yeah, seems like a, a lot of great um, projects there. Um, and then Trevor, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Trevor Cohen. Um, I'm a professor of biomedical informatics and medical education at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, originally, I trained as a physician in South Africa and practiced for a bit. My main clinical interest at that point was in psychiatry. But then I, I sort of veered off and uh, pursued a PhD in biomedical informatics at Columbia. And my work at that point, you know, I became very interested in distributed representations, like word vector representations of um, language. And what drew me to them was how they could bridge, like bridge semantic gaps between what was said in psychiatric narratives and clinical notes and the extent to which we could capture those concepts using symbolic models. And, um, you know, they're pretty broad reaching psychiatric narratives. So at the time it seemed intractable to model them symbolically. Um, and then, you know, I think the reason, like the line of work that's maybe most relevant to this panel is um, after a point, once I graduated, I moved to Arizona State University in a faculty position. And um, at a certain point, I was at an AMIA conference and I was interested in ways to improve these distributed representations by encoding additional knowledge into them. And I bumped into Tom Reinflesch, whom many of you know, um, who was based at the National Library of Medicine and developed a system called SEMREP that extracted structured knowledge from um, biomedical text and became interested in encoding these structured representations into vector space and a sort of a line of research that's emerged from that, looking at how to reason in a vector space that's derived from structured knowledge and 
bring structured knowledge to inform vector spaces that have been extra extracted from text and so on. And so, yeah, you know, I think those are the lines of work that are maybe most pertinent to this panel. And I'll I'll stop at that point so we can start discussing the, the topics. Uh, thank you, Trevor. That sounds great. Um, and just very quickly, my name is Lucy Luong. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the Allen Institute for AI, where I primarily work on extracting information out of biomedical texts, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, and uh, so I thought we could start um, pretty high level. So one of the, uh, the points that some of you have brought up already and also came up during our previous keynotes with uh, Olivier and, and also Karen um, is that there is this interplay now between what we consider structured knowledge and the kind of unstructured data from which we derive this uh, information, either through manual curation or maybe some sometimes through um, semi-automated or automated extraction. So can you all talk a bit about um, kind of how we can bring these different forms of um, structured and unstructured data together successfully? And how do we bridge uh, essentially the chasm between them? Does anyone? I can start. So I, I think first uh, we need uh, to leverage a lot of the uh, clinical terminologies, ontologies, and then common data models. So for example, right now we have the um, <clears throat> For phenotyping knowledge, we have a human phenotype ontology. We have been using that to annotate the phenotype information from the EHR narratives, the clinical notes. And then we also have, for structured data, we also have the um, Odyssey OMAP common data model. We have been using that in multiple uh, large scale national data networks, such as N3C, um, OFS, uh, PCORI, um, so I think, you know, use the uses of this um, terminologies, ontologies should be um, supported and then uh, expected from anyone who want to kind of uh, link their data to the shared uh, networks. <clears throat> Maybe I can go next since um, some of our, my work is very related and I can just build on what on what Chinua had had suggested. So I, I completely agree. I think, you know, um, ontologies like the human phenotype ontology, which is developed by the Monarch Initiative, which is our consortia, um, was really originally designed to help um, phenotype for disease patients. And it's actually the basis for what I described earlier for the interoperability with basic research. So it's important to rec recognize from the text mining angle that ontologies like the human phenotype ontology that have that rich axiomatization um, is, are actually built for data integration purposes. So it's not just that you can get richer phenotypic descriptions out of the EHR text, but then you also get the added value of having sort of ready-made integration potential with basic research data like the gene ontology, gene function data, exposure data, many other kinds of assay data. And so, so that's one, one really great opportunity for using kind of, you know, more sophisticated owl-based um, ontologies for the, for the named entity recognition in clinical notes or in literature. Um, the second thing I might suggest too is that I think, you know, one of the things that we struggle with a little bit is that when we do mine EHR notes um, or the literature uh, using these types of terminologies, we, we often lose the context of those assertions. So for example, if we say that someone does not have something, but it's in a long list, that might that sort of not might not be captured effectively. And so then we accidentally encode the fact that we think that phenotypic feature is present when in fact it was actually declared that it wasn't. And so I think we need better mechanisms to encode the context along with the um, named entity recognition, but then also potentially confidence scores so that when we have you know, structured data that someone has coded using the HPO, for example, and combining that with unstructured um, NLP extractions, that we don't treat those, those um, those terms, those entities as being associated with the patient with the same degree of certainty. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to do to think about the context and the, and the confidence level of those outputs to be used in combination um, with the structured data. So, so uh, 
yeah, I think I'm going to try to give a completely different slant on the on, on this question. So just you know, coming from where I come from and my my um, methodological biases and so on. So yeah, you know, to me this is it's just another reflection of like the oldest problem, the perennial problem in AI, which is well, do people reason symbolically and deductively, or do they associate and pattern recognize? And you know, how can we bring these things together to come up with? Um, systems that have both of these capacities that people clearly demonstrate and, and so you know then the question becomes right now uh, you know I can say like I couldn't have said this 10 years ago when I first got into this stuff but right now the predominant representation for unstructured text is some sort of vector space representation right if you're willing to say a contextual vector that comes out of BERT or some transformer is a vector space um, representation, it's just, you know, weights, um, continuous values. So then the question becomes, well, how do we bridge from symbols, you know, back to these vector spaces? And, and one way to do it is to put the symbols into the vector space that like we've been very interested in that for a long time. Um, that might be as straightforward as building, you know, running your transformers on models where the text has been replaced by concepts that are linked in vocabulary. So they're working with vocabularies that can then be used to bridge to other domains. Um, alternately, um, the vector spaces can be used to help to generate symbolic representations that can then be used symbolically. So the work that you know some of you have probably seen looking at how to build out, I think that's one of the other topics. So, you know, like how to build out a knowledge base using natural language processing. So I guess that's my slant. I just see, you, you, you know, another reflection of the same problem of, well, how do we get from similarity-based association um, that comes from pattern recognition to like formal deduction that can get us to truth, um, assertions of truth. Yeah, does anyone want to jump in? Uh, feel free. Um, I, I guess I want to make, you know, just respond to some of what you've said, which is like, um, I think for these vector space representations of unstructured text, um, they can be very useful and kind of responsive to changes in uh, knowledge a little bit more quickly than the symbolic systems. Um, but the the kind of, I, in my mind, the usefulness of having structured knowledge is that um, you need significantly less unstructured data in order to arrive at this knowledge that we sort of as a community have um, already uh, evaluated and confirmed to be more likely to be true. Um, so is there some way of, for example, balancing um, what is available in these knowledge graphs and in these ontologies and using them when, um, when it makes sense to, to perform reasoning uh, on entities and relations that we have a lot of information about and are already encoded in these knowledge bases versus for something like a long tail or emerging entity, which is maybe mentioned only in the unstructured text, but hasn't been represented in these knowledge bases. Yeah, so Lucy, to like to paraphrase, so is the thought, well, like how do we, if we have a knowledge base that's limited in scope, but well structured and we trust it, it's been curated and, you know, like it, it's much more trustworthy than anything we can get out of natural language processing currently, right. but it's missing some recent entities and how can we bridge from the rare, you know, the, the recently encountered entities back to the knowledge Based. Exactly. Like what happens at the boundary of yeah. unstructured texts and these knowledge bases? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there are a couple of bridges that are maybe worth mentioning. So um, the basic problem is to get, I think, from the unknown to the known, right? Like there's something we know very little about. We'd like to map it to something we know something about. And I guess there are different ways to build that bridge from models that infer on the basis of what they've seen in text, you know, similarities between things to models that can actually reason deductively um, using an ontology. And, you know, I guess it's a bridge that goes both ways. So like one of the techniques we've found quite useful is retrofitting. Um, 
where the idea would be we have vector representations of things and we have a terminology and we can bring the terminology into the vector space by using it to change the relationships between vectors in the space. Um, that doesn't exactly answer your, your question. It's a bridge the other way, right? But, um, you know, other sorts of bridges are using morphology, like, like we've seen with fast text embeddings or just transformers where they have word piece tokenization. So words that have similar units can end up with similar representations. So, um, and then maybe drawing on other resources like um, the chemical structure, you know, to find similarities between things that are newly encountered and things that are in an ontology um, could be useful. You know, those, are, those are some sort of rare entity techniques that we found useful in our work. Gotcha. And, you know, I want to pose this question to Melissa and Chunghua too, where like kind of from a more curational standpoint, when do you decide how to, like when it's appropriate to add a new entity or relation to some of these uh, shared data models. So I yeah. think, oh, sorry. Manisa, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I will okay. follow you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so I think maybe just um, taking a step back to a couple of things that Trevor suggested, and then I'll, I'll come to your, your question, Lucy. You know, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we, you know, we, we really want in these sort of knowledge, you know, aggregation context is to support, you know, more robust deductive reasoning and revealing of potential data linkages that are otherwise, you know, um, not apparent. And I think we, you know, we can, what we can be doing. So what I mentioned earlier about sort of that ontological integration based upon the logical axioms in the ontology, the same thing goes for how we mine the literature. So I've, I've noticed that not a lot of people are actually leveraging the ontology axioms to help boost confidence of the named entity recognition. So for example, if we have synonyms or axioms that you know, declare a certain anatomical or cellular part, um, those terms themselves that are built into the axioms, but not necessarily the label of the primary term aren't really being effectively used for the text mining. So I think there's a whole area of research that could be extended that focuses on leveraging ontological axioms for you know, um, feeding into confidence scores and you know, looking for sort of guilt by association. The other thing we can do is we can, um, and we do have some algorithms for, for doing this where we can sort of make it, and this is coming to Lucy's questions, where we're based upon um, existing data linkages, we can make suggestions. So for example, if we're curating a patient's record with HPO terms, we know from protein-protein interactions across different species that there are similar phenotypes associated with the ones that have been entered already. Um, so now we can make that suggestion to the um, clinical geneticist to consider um, terms that might be relevant based upon those, those connections within the data. And it's not just about, you know, um, frequency of term annotation, because I think a lot of people are doing that, but actually leveraging those rare data linkages using all the different kind of cross species and cross contextual data, um, guilt by associations to make those types of recommendations uh, for further curation. Yeah, and I also want to mention um, laser pos um, potential opportunity to involve human in a loop. Because I'm, you know, when we are using all these existing terminologies or ontologies, we actually find um, some terms they used more frequently than others, and other terms they just created, they sit in the ontology, rarely gets used. Um, so. <clears throat> I think if we can somehow um, incorporate this um, or close the feedback loop on, and incorporate the information about you know what information what ontology entry or terminology entry will be practically useful, and then uh, we can kind of annotate that in the ontology, and then that can help us to better understand you know what uh, concept or concept relationship will be relevant and useful in um, in practical settings. Um, so I think in, um, in terminology space, people have been separating reference um, terminology from uh, interface terminology. And then they have been uh, kind of, a, you know, 
um, segment large complex ontology or knowledge resources and identify a small relevant piece or portion uh, for specific applications. Um, I think if we can somehow kind of incorporate this user input and based on their needs and application needs and uh, allow people to um, leverage a specific concept or relationship for specific task or context, that will be useful as well. Um, it's a great point, uh, especially about kind of this human in the loop. I, to clarify, Chunghua, are you talking about using human in the loop feedback to create these interface or application terminologies? Uh, continuously refining uh, ontology, because mm -hmm. I feel like a life cycle of ontology right now is, okay, we design it, we deploy it. Now it's mm -hmm. out there in the community, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, in regarding how, which concepts will, will, are used frequently, which concepts are useful for specific context or task, we don't have a mechanism to bring that feedback to the uh, designers of the ontology, or maybe they already finished their mission, right? I, I feel like in the EHR world, people are take, talking about learning, um, learning system, learning health system. But I feel like if for ontology design, since this is a, a knowledge resource we'll be using on daily basis, we somehow also need to support the continu continuous learning, continuous refining um, of the ontology. And in that way, we can kind of achieve a more um, uh, efficient and then, um, and then remove things that will retire over time or become irrelevant over time. Gotcha. Um, so I wanna kind of um, uh, revisit, uh, so I think er earlier, uh, Melissa was talking about how certain entities um, maybe aren't, uh, or I, I guess, Various people have talked about how certain entities are not very well represented either in the ontology or the or the text. Um, so I want to ask: um, Is kind of what is maybe the unit of knowledge that is appropriate to be represented in these structured terminologies or ontologies? And then, um, in cases where there might be, for example, contradiction in, in the uh, in the text or in the clinical notes for a specific relationship and its existence. How should these structured ontologies handle this type of contradictory evidence? So I have I have one one comment. It's it's um, maybe only a very small partial answer to your question, <laughs> um, but I I think you know one of the challenges that we have is this tension between individual level, you know, data information and sort of canonical knowledge in the ontology. And where, where do you draw the line? And I think what we've seen with our work on rare disease phenotypic um, information, where we have sort of canonical representations of rare disease phenotypic features, and we try to garner a um, degree of information about, um, sorry, it's wake up time here. <laughs> Um, uh, we, we try to garner information about the, let's say, frequency of that symptom being associated with a given patient, and then curate those rules into the canonical information that can then be used in the downstream diagnostic applications. But one of the hugest problems is that we don't actually get the case level information very much. We get these tables in the literature that say this many patients had this feature and that many patients had that feature, but not patient X had feature number one, feature number two, but not feature number three. And so our, so there's this tension between how, how you, how you represent the evidence in the canonical context versus being data driven and how you derive um, those numbers. And I think we need to move, move more towards that data driven representation, but still using the standards that we have in hand. And we've been for this particular use case, but I think this applies to many different kinds of um, examples. Uh, we've been developing the phenopackets standard to you know, help provide a computable representation of the case level information that if we collect a bazillion different phenopackets about patients, now we actually infer and calculate those, those numbers rather than trying to, you know, kind of 
garner them from summary level um, information that we get in the literature or, or through other venues. So that's very interesting. Actually, Melissa, you mentioned that. Maybe I can comment on that. Because uh, uh, we are also um, hope, um, la leverage, trying to leverage the phenol packet uh, and then to uh, for uh, rare disease phenotype representation. And I, I totally agree with you. Like in, in addition to having HPO, which has a lot of concepts, phenotype concept and relationship, we also need this higher level, like go beyond the concept level, but also to the individual level or case level representation that give us richer uh, information about the phenotype, phenotype look, um, temporal uh, course of the phenotype. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I think that idea of um, like fleshing out the structure of canonical knowledge with empirical observations is really appealing. And, and I, I suppose to do that, we, we really would need accurate extraction of the um, ontology concepts from the, from the records, right? Like there's not, there's not any other way to do it. So. Yeah. Right, because it, it ultimately it'd be great if you could have full linking between all the clinical records, all of the scientific literature, and these various relationships in uh, being represented in these ontologies. And I think the HPO is a very good example of this because phenotypes are associated to diseases, but they're not necessarily always, uh, you know, uh, gonna, uh, like not everybody who has a certain disease will have um, the same set of phenotypes. Um, um, may, I, may I interject and, and just yeah, ask a please. question uh, generally, because I had I, I didn't know about this phenol packet um, um, uh, idea and work on it. Um, so so when we're when we're looking at literature, generally uh, a lot of the information there is somewhat uncertain, somewhat vague. Uh, it might apply to yes, fifty out of two hundred patients. Um, this kind of uncertainty, uh, Melissa, is that is that also kind of part of um, the uh, standards that you're developing? Because ontologies, by definition, are generally quite rigid in terms of what you can have in them. Uh, but are you are you also sort of thinking about these uncertainty aspects? Yes, exactly. And we we also another good example is um, you know, and I I, know I have two examples actually. So. One is, is it's not specific just to, to phenotypes, this, this, this challenge of canonical anatomy and, you know, or canonical knowledge versus sort of data-driven knowledge. And I'm going to put my family in the other room. Um, the, um, for anatomy, for example, we have staging for different anatomical structures and similar to the easiest case where not every patient has every feature. Um, you know, canonical and not anatomy is canonical. And so, you know, I, I was very surprised at one point where somebody emailed me and said, hey, I see an organism that has this structure that's not actually in the window that's described as being the developmental canonical window. Um, and it's like, well, that's because canonical, any knowledge is, is, a, is a, you know, has a distribution. And we were sort of trying to capture you know, there, there basically is no organism that, that has the specific canonical anatomy in that case. It's just a, 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 you know, it's an average of our knowledge, if you will. And so I think we have to sort of keep that in, in mind is that these, these, uh, these very rigorous and, and, you know, kind of limiting um, knowledge structures like ontologies are meant to help us structure our knowledge and compute over it doesn't mean that they represent every instance um, out there as, as perfectly as one, one might like. So that's that's one example, and then I think this, the second example, but more to your point about, you know, how do we represent the uncertainty? We've been doing a lot of work with evidence modeling. Uh, we have an ontology called um, Sepio, which is the you know evidence um, sort of an evidence model, if you will, for how we can um, assess the degree of evidence based upon um, you know different types of, of evidence lines. So, for example, if if two and this has been especially impactful for the ACMG genetics guidelines for variant interpretation, where you may have evidence from a model organism, you may have pathogenicity evidence. Those are two very different lines of evidence um, that if together might be more, more stronger evidence than if we simply have two very similar model organism experiments. And so it's, it's really sort of trying to think about 
the similarity of our different lines of knowledge in assessing a confidence score for, for evidence. Um, and so I think those kinds of approaches are gonna become increasingly valuable as we start to come up with better ways of representing you know, um, what kinds of evidence do we have in hand and how do they combine to sort of help make clinical decision-making more impactful and, and, and better sort of justified. So you want to add to that? <laughs> um. well, I think it feels like we said we're kind of on the brink of talking about um, reasoning under uncertainty or sort of you know probabilistic approaches, right? Like if we have this knowledge structure that is populated with like weights of evidence of each assertion in it based on empirical data, like what well, what next? You know, like how how would we deploy that to to draw conclusions about a particular patient or about the likelihood of a the treatment being effective. I mean, I you know I think those are open questions, and like I'm, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we have good answers. There may be good directions for future research. Um. So, so uh, I want to. Uh, I have another question um, for for all of you. That's a little bit unrelated to this. Um. But I guess in in natural language processing and text mining. There has been a kind of recent line of work on sort of probing these large pre-trained contextual language models to determine whether they contain the knowledge that is otherwise represented in these structured knowledge bases and ontologies. Um, so for example, you might ask like, uh, what's a drug treatment for Alzheimer's disease and then ask the language model to produce a mass token uh, and then verify that against uh, existing knowledge in a knowledge base. What do you all think about the claims that these language models may or may not be able to act as knowledge bases uh, and especially in how this like applies in the biomedical domain? Let, that's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I have limited experience with uh, deep learning. So I will just share my um, um, very naive understanding. And because uh, I feel like the purpose of knowledge representation or knowledge base is to make uh, shareable knowledge, like create uh, explicit representation, right? Um, and shareable knowledge resources. I guess the these language models, their challenge for people is the, um, the lack of interpre interpretability. Um, I feel these are very two different, uh, two different results. Um, so I, I, I personally feel I wouldn't call it as a knowledge representation uh, because it, I think for AI, people say you can have explicit representation. You can also have intelligence without representation. So I feel like the language models are kind of more on the latter side. They support intelligence, but they don't necessarily have explicit formal representation that can enable, you know, this uh, deduction um, rule-based in reasoning. <clears throat> Right, that's a good point. Sometimes these language models have also been found to kind of contradict themselves in certain cases. Um, does anyone else want to, to add to that? Well, you know, maybe a, a softer form of the question would be, well, uh, how could these language models be used to assist the process of ontology construction or curation, right? Like, um, uh, I think, you, you know, a fundamental problem is at the end of the day, if you, if you ask, you know, PubMed Bert, what treats Alzheimer's, you'll get back some, some tokens, right? But you, you don't get back something that can be linked in an obvious way to, to an ontology. Um, it might be interesting to train PubMed, but if we had the resources on um, the literature with the concepts in it, you know, so we could, we could then at least get concepts back at the end of the day. I think there'd be a more direct, direct path to integration there. Well, one of the things, you know, in the paper that you sent, one of the points that was raised was that the model performed poorly in many-to-many -many relationship settings. And I think we're always in many-to-many -many relationship settings in medicine, right? Like every drug treats 
many diseases that can be treated by many drugs and so on. And so, you know, I think we'd probably need stronger performance in that setting to be at the point where we could try to put together a tool that would convince people working with ontologies that they were getting back useful answers. I mean, I mean that said, the models remember a lot, right? Like, I, I mean, they clearly do. Um, you, you can get answers to questions phrased in natural language that are really impressive off the bat with these models. So, so yeah, you, you know, maybe the, the question is more, well, how can we, how can we find ways to take the strengths of these models and, and make them useful in the context of formal knowledge modeling, rather than can we replace an ontology with, you, you know, with PubMed birds? And, I think I think also I mean again we kind of keep coming back to this this tension between um, you know real world data and you know canonical knowledge representation and I think there's a tendency in the ontology community well there's you know the ontology community like like all scientific communities kind of spans the gamut there's there are ontologies that are grossly over-engineered. No one would ever capture data using some of the content and no one has demonstrated the utility of the inferencing that is supplied by that. And so why are we you know, doing such gymnastics to create such knowledge representation if it's not fit for purpose? Um, on the other hand, we have lots of ontologies that are so poorly engineered that they become less useful for, for mining um, data or text. Um, and, and so, because we just don't have the right axioms or the right synonyms or the right cross-reference structures or any provenance where the data came from, or it's not really multiple inheritance, so we don't really get as much out of it. And so I think there's this, this need for sort of fit for purpose somewhere in the middle that, um, that can sort of best get us what we need um, out of the literature, out of any uh, EHR text, um, but but not be so burdensome, and then somehow use that as a sort of you know extraction component, but not it's it's necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? So the sufficient part comes with the various kinds of inference and integrations that we were talking about earlier, but also with the sort of fit for purpose needs of any given circumstance. So how do we sort of use that that knowledge representation in combination with the text and the data that we have in hand to our max to maximum effect so it's really about sort of um, creating a configuration for each context that we might want to use these things that's maximally efficient both you know person time and computationally um, so i think that's where there's a lot of challenges and and, and we're really struggling still yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, coming from a more NLP perspective, I feel like at the current um, state of things, uh, it seems that these ontologies are actually a bit more useful for maybe helping to probe the consistency or the factual knowledge that these contextual language models are able to acquire from the text. Um, so uh, I think, you know, as Trevor noted that uh, this paper I sent out, which was really just, um, it was the Sebastian Riedel uh, group's paper on language models as knowledge bases, just mostly like a, a thought experiment, I feel. Um, but it, it is useful to kind of know how much of this information these models are able to memorize and sort of regurgitate. Um, and if there are kind of non-factual information, for example, if they're producing the, the wrong relationships between certain classes of entities, like what is the implication of that uh, when we're then using that same model to uh, perform predictions in, in a clinical setting or, or so on. And then the other, um, the other point uh, that I think maybe is worth talking about is, um, so we often talk about ontologies maybe taking time to curate and maybe are, are not as representative of the current state of data, but actually a lot of these pre-trained contextual language models are also grounded in some like slice of text uh, from a certain time. So, you know, if you ask Bert like who the president of the U.S. is, we might always be stuck in the year frame between 2014 and 2020. And um, I wonder if uh, the same kind of situation would manifest for, for biomedical relationships as well as we move forward in time, but these models maybe are not um, updated uh, to, to um, be trained on the latest literature or clinical notes. Yeah. 
Um, so I wanted to make sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if somebody's used the term like on onto ontology vigilance or something like that. Like it seemed like we were touching on that earlier, right? Like how do we keep track of if the ontologies are used and keep track of if they're up to date? I mean, I mean, Lucy, I think that notion that you could use a language model to see if the ontology you know is up to date really it has so it has potential, right? Like, <laughs> like what is the weight of evidence from the literature for this assertion in an ontology? Seems like something we could do with today's technology. Yeah. For sure, it could be a. It sounds like a very good situation for some kind of cyclic. I I love this onto vigilance. Uh, situation as well. Um, but I think it's bi-directional, like kind of using the ontology to um, probe the language model and using the language model and new new texts, new publications, new patient records to validate the ontology. Yeah. And, and you know, going back to the kind of uh, these probabilistic relationships as well, um, being able to associate uh, those with the ontology relationships. But onto a vigilance noise. coined right here. <laughs> yeah. uh, it seems like there's a lot of noise uh, basically found with those kind of um, studies that look at whether language models can be used as knowledge bases or do they have any kind of knowledge in them? For it seems like as many studies as there are, which find that yes, there's some knowledge, there are others that find counter evidence to that, that there are some very basic uh, kind of um, things that are misrepresented, or you can adversarially just basically get them to give you the wrong answer, even though you know, you're just adding one word, perturbing the input a little bit. Um, so it seems key that um, if you're doing something like that, if, you're, if you wanna kind of use, um, language models for, for a kind of onto vigilance task, something like that. Certainly, uh, you know, humans need to be kind of big part of it and you can't really totally rely on uh, language models to give you, um, yeah, uh, good knowledge. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks in the audience are um, able to ask questions. So if you have any questions for uh, the um, speakers, please feel free to either jump in or post that in the chat. Um, right. So, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of another question for you all. Um, so th uh, thinking more about this um, context of kind of biomedical knowledge synthesis. Um, what do you think would be sort of like the ultimate thing that you would want to see in this domain? Like the kind of relationship between all the all these things we've talked about, ontology, human in the loop, maybe NLP methods. I think um, you know one of the one of the things that our, the community has also been working on, and we probably just need more community together to work on it, is this idea of mapping. And the, the dirty word of mapping hasn't come up yet in our conversation, <laughs> um, which is that we you know we consistently need to transform data from one encoding to another. But all mappings are lossy, and most of them lack provenance. So. You know, it may be that you know my mapping might be very robust, but if I haven't declared how I did it, when I did it, what the rules of that mapping were, someone else can't really judge whether or not that mapping for their transformation would be fit for purpose for their use case. So we've been working on this new simple standard for ontology mappings that basically kind of declare those types of rules, um, and I think it's 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 really interesting because I think the you know, we've we maybe done a better job of this in some contexts, but it's becoming increasingly critical in the clinical context where everybody's mapping everything. I mean, think about like, you know, the Odyssey community itself is a giant mapping machine across many different terminologies within OMOP. You know, we have the UMLS, which similarly um, maps a bunch of different terminologies. Um, and in both cases, we don't really have 
the full provenance for how those mapping decisions were decided. And so that means that if for different types of computational use, you know, many of us have to go and create our own new third set of mappings instead of being able to potentially reuse the mappings as an artifact itself. And so increasing the sort of um, strategies, methods, um, and just documentation and provenance um, around how we do those mappings, I think is a critical component because, you know, and, and in many cases, the, the ontologies that are created, you know, there's always the claim that, oh, well, we built it for a different purpose. Well, you might have built it for a different context for sure. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of overlapping content that isn't really needing to be different, but because these things have evolved from different communities and different contexts, we're never gonna get away from this problem of needing to map, but we need to manage the lossiness um, in, a, in a computationally sophisticated way so that our, our confidence, as we were talking about earlier, um, can take that into account. So if I am creating a confidence value for data that leverages you know, data transformations based on those mappings, I have to be able to take into account the provenance of those mappings as part of that confidence scoring system. And we are not doing that yet, um, to, at least not in any major kind of way. Yeah, that's a great point. And then I think when when you talk about mapping, another thing I think about is uh, sort of like versioning between ontologies. So if you merge uh, concepts or break them into sub concepts, um, kind of every every downstream application system that's maybe leveraging the ontology needs to make similar changes. And how how do we make it easier for, for people to adapt to those as well. Um, it's not equivalent to mapping, but I think there's, there's some similarities. And then also kind of whether mapping can be done in isolation to uh, being able to propose changes to the ontology itself um, or the ontologies that are being mapped. So, so was the broader question about um, like synthesis or what we what what we'd like to see happen? You know. Here? Yeah. So, so Trevor, why don't um, uh, why don't you just uh, talk about what do you think? What would be something ideal that you would like to see um, in in this field? Yeah, I think you know, building in part on the discussion today and also um, the discussions I've had recently around like AI and medicine and so on. I think what, I, what I'd like to see is I'd, I'd like to see the rationalists and the empiricists sort of come together, you know, it's um, like in, in our own work, we found ontological structures really useful as a way to improve representations that are derived from language, right? But I, I feel like there's a sort of middle ground where uh, e e empirically driven methods have a lot of attention at the moment, right? Like when people think what is AI, they're probably thinking more about large language models than about ontologies. But, you know, to my mind, it, it's sort of a, it's a mistake not to draw on, on both. And like we have these really rich curated knowledge structures that exist in the biomedical domain in particular. And I think an important question is, well, how can we use those in conjunction with empirically driven models of language or data um, to improve the, the outcome we're looking for in the context of whatever a project might be. And like one of the fundamental concerns there, I think, is how to draw inference across uncertain, like large amounts of uncertain, potentially contradictory knowledge, as you mentioned in the discussion questions. You know, and it's like, well, if we have an inference that is imperfect, but still leads us to a good hypothesis that can then be later tested with more formal deductive methods, that's still useful. And maybe in that space between these two approaches, there's a lot of fertile ground for, for methodological development and progress. And that's my, my stump speech. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I, I think uh, some, of, some of the things that we uh, haven't really talked about today is kind of where, in, in what areas are these structured resources maybe more useful than unstructured texts? And I think you're alluding to some of these cases, you know, when we don't have a lot of uh, unstructured texts about certain things, like, for example, in, in common sense, or for these like long-tailed entities, for negated entities, things like that. And then also 
um, I think some of the flaws of unstructured texts are, uh, you know, they, they might represent certain biases that we have uh, as humans that we can offset using a more structured representation, like if, if we're able to have AI that leverages these more stru structured, um, structured representations and maybe uh, where we can kind of reduce how that bias is encoded. Um, so I think, I mean, obviously, I, I also feel like there, there can be a lot of um, benefit to uh, trying to leverage both of these types of um, uh, uh, knowledge and data. Um, I guess, so, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, Trevor. Oh, I was going to say, so Melissa had mentioned something about using axioms from ontologies as a way to assess like the possibility of things that are being observed. I, I mean, you know, that seems like a, a point of intersection between fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, I wish that more ontologies had high quality axioms for us to take advantage of as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, things like, for example, like if I, like, let's say I have you know, hippocampus, you know, um, I have a hippocampal, you know, malformation term, it, it's a phenotype term, I should be looking for the constituent parts of the hippocampus. So for example, if I see a phrase in the next in one of the adjacent sentences for Purkinje cells, then that boosts the confidence, even though the language, you know, the terms themselves, you have to know that Purkinje cells are part of the hippocampus campus, right? So it's those kinds of things. I think there's just not been a lot of research in how we use that to evaluate the confidence of, of the scoring um, uh, for things. So I think that's really great. The other comment I might make is it's also, I think, really challenging to build ontologies that have good axiomatization because they necessarily, the ones that have the best axioms are the ones that have a large diverse group of, of contributors who are actually curating data at the same time or evaluating literature at the same time. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you remove the building of ontologies from the data processes, they, they just don't grow in that same kind of way or as, as in a sophisticated way. And unfortunately, uh, most of our funding bodies, um, especially in the United States, don't really think about how the data generators should be partnered with the some you know knowledge engineers as part of their data dissemination and and data management practices so if we can come up with strategies to help partner the semantic engineers together with the data generators at the start um, we're going to end up with much better axioms in the ontology and much better ontologies at the other end Absolutely. Yeah. Colette, I feel like it looks like we can um, explore a new publication model because right now a lot of knowledge they are locked in these free text PubMed articles, right? Um, but maybe in the future, <clears throat> people, uh, all the authors will submit their data, like raw data. Um, and I think NIH is also pushing for this, sharing more um, data uh, when they publish. And then journals are also. Um, I think some journals are already doing this. Whenever you want to get published in high impact journals, you need to submit raw data. So I guess the relationship between knowledge and data, because you know the knowledge is derived from the data. And once this big data is available, how do we um, kind of you know manage the relationship between the knowledge and data? I think this is a new is a new. Um, front um, for us to explore. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And then uh, of course that brings up questions around reproducibility and, and all of these like lovely, uh, <laughs> lovely things around the publication process. <laughs> uh, and also the deposition of maybe negative uh, data or data with negative results. Right. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the hour. Uh, any last comments uh, from from the panelists? I think I, I and you know I really want to thank you for organizing this because I feel this is a, such an important 
topic and <laughs> it needs a, a lot of more work. And then um, I, please keep us posted how we can con continue to contribute to this topic. Because I personally, I'm still, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of knowledge are locked in PubMed and now I'm kind of doing NLP to extract the PICO and then converting this into structured PubMed. And then I, I'm, that's why I'm, I, I was, I'm wondering, you know, what if it would be nice in the future, everything can start from structure form, uh, from the author side from the beginning and we don't have to do this all, all this ad hoc NLP. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and then um, kind of to your point, uh, something I would like to see is um, even when the uh, publications and the data are less structured, um, it would be great if, for example, you know, when you're running these NLP models to extract PICO or other structured mm -hmm. data, that those annotations could be much more easily shared uh, so that um, kind of the whole community can leverage all of these annotations that have been provided on this unstructured data. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, any last thoughts, uh, Trevor? Uh, maybe a, a last thought about hedging. So I, I'm just really looking <laughs> at it. So you, you know, so that like the idea that if something is said in the literature, the strength of that assertion varies mm -hmm. in different ways. So, you know, Halil has done work on like the linguistically how strong the assertion is. Does someone say this shows this or this suggests this and so on? But the, and then there's also, well, you know, how good is the public, like what, where was it published and how much do I trust that publication? Like that's a, when we've studied people exploring knowledge, that's a standard lyric they use. Well, I'm not sure about this journal, right? But if it comes from here, I, I don't know how you render that computational, but that is how scientists work, right? And then on top of that, and this really just comes out of the questions that you wrote, um, Lucy, like what about the context? Like it might be true in the context of this patient population or this anomaly. And, and so like, how, how can we model all of that um, uncertainty and bring that together, you know, with an assertion that might end up um, in a formal knowledge structure? Um, I'm gonna leave that as a big open question for the, for the field, I think. A lot more work for us. Yeah, um, which is good. Yeah, and Melissa, any? Uh, last thoughts. I, I think, um, you know, what's been really exciting about the conversation today is really just sort of kind of, you know, addressing these tensions that we have between clinical and basic research, structured and unstructured knowledge, uh, between, you know, how we use the ontologies for extracting information um, from unstructured um, content and then have that iteration. And and how and the sort of tension around you know data driven versus you know knowledge engineering and the sort of confidence um, issues that we have, and then the sort of like um, currency issues and how do we sort of know that the knowledge that we have, which you know can sometimes be like you know life or death situations if the knowledge isn't there, the wrong diagnosis gets made or the wrong drug gets prescribed, you know it's really important that knowledge is current and so how do we leverage the unstructured knowledge, you know, to help make sure that the structured knowledge that feeds all of our information and clinical decision systems, um, or other kinds of systems as well, it could be, you know, you know, all kinds of different, you know, public systems, um, you know, is working effectively, and, and, and we that we can keep those things current. And, you know, there's just, you know, it, it definitely takes a village, you know, there's many different people who need to be involved in kind of overcoming these, these three different sets of tensions um, together. And so I, I'd love to see, you know, more venues and better funding mechanisms to help support those kinds of integrations and kind of cross-sectoral um, integration. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that this is just such an important problem and um, glad we're all uh, thinking about it. So I, you know, I want to thank you all so much for coming here and being a part of this panel. Um, uh, and uh, let's, I guess, like everyone, give the panelists a round of applause. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing these conversations in other settings. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Um, okay, so uh, I think this is essentially the close of our workshop. Um, I again want to thank all of the speakers and panelists and attendees, um, as well as the members of the program and organizing committees who are here. So the organizing committee um, is Faizi, Bridget, Helio, and myself. Um, and then we will be editing the videos of the talks, uh, uploading them, and making those available on our uh, workshop website shortly after today. Um, and if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out and contact us. But thank you all for joining and uh, look forward to uh, connecting at a later time. Bye. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.